unajivunia sana kwa Kenya kwa sababu ni nchi ya amani. Naweza tembea Kenya yote bila kusunguliwa. Kenya is a one country that is most, most admired because of uh, marathon runners. Our culture is one of the best in the world. Nashukuru kwa sababu ya demokrasia tuliyonayo. Kenya ni nchi bora yani ya pendeza tu. Kenya si hali I think the most important quality of a leader is wisdom so that the decisions that are being made now he knows how you know it's like a chess player who sees 10 moves ahead Najua wakati ambao kama mlipa ushuru mlipa ushuru alipa ushuru wake anataka aone angalau kazi ya pesa yake ambayo anailipia If pesa tunaamini kwa zinaishia kwa mifuko za watu binafsi I think it's important that wealth is declared frequently and if people have found ways to accumulate wealth very quickly um, absolutely good for them as long as of course that is done honestly and ethically we need leaders who are well educated to understand uh, the challenges that we face in the modern world kwa mfano mtu mwenye amesomea ukandarasi wa barabara mkiwa mkiwa na kiongozi ambaye amesomea yote aluma una uhakika kwamba barabara za eneo lako zitakuwa zina usimamizi mzuri the government is really trying it especially and it can be seen because of the wide uh, Kenyan presence online We're able to transport guys uh, easily and quickly um, through the SGR sasa shida ya hii barabara tu moja ni choo hakuna choo huku barabarani facilities zimekuja karibu especially shule na moto kama stima sasa hii ziko mpaka kwa mashinani my two boys both of them were delivered in a government facility the maternity services of the hook you may find that in our hospital it's more developed yes but there are no medicine there are no doctors dawa unanunua nje kupimwa unaenda unapimwa nje sasa hapo ukuja ni kuandikiwa tu there's a lot of people walking around in the country with mental health issues that have gone unidentified kuna shida usalama sana cuz unakuta watu hata during the day they are being robbed mostly even when you call the police hakuna kitu watakusaidia nayo they'll just tell you come and record statement after that nothing kila mtu apewe huduma sawa si ati wale wengine wale wenye nafasi ya juu wanapewa huduma za bora kushinda watu wa chini platforms such as e citizens um are very useful in making it easier for uh, citizens to be able to access uh, the necessary rec- and requisite uh, documents that allow them to to begin their journey of formalization before vision 2030 if you look at what we had in 2002 and be- before that it's not comparable to what we have today today with huduma centers you can really really do a lot you know passports and uh, your um, your driving license and you know uh, UNHIF card and all that i think those for me have been very impressive um does the system work completely uh, smooth no kwa mfano mimi nime mimi nimezaliwa na kuru nimezaliwa mahali hapa inaitwa bondeni hospital nilipoenda kuchukua id nilikuwa vetted of which i believe my documents are sure is enough is enough documents to prove i'm a kenyan and my birth certificate those are enough documents so i don't know why you are being vetted in fact that's easy watoto wetu wengi for the last two years hajapata id since covid yeah because there was no vetting committee i lost my id and i was going to replace it it's been a month yet a friend of mine that we went to do it at the same time got it two weeks after i should be able to see the service being prepared for me and talk about the quality about how it is being done is it going to achieve what i want is a cost right kusema kweli ukiangalia wana Kenya kijumla hasa wale ambao wamebobea katika biashara wengi sana wanajivunia kuwa wana Kenya kwa sababu ya biashara biashara yote ambayo utaweka Kenya na ufanye katika njia nzuri utakuta ya kwamba ina nawiri sana ukiangalia wengi sana kama tukikumbuka marehemu Chris Kirobi alikuwa ni mfanya biashara mzuri sana na amebobea kwa sababu e ni mwekezaji local investor lakini alibobea vizuri sana katika biashara yake na kuna wengi ambaye pia wamefanya biashara hapa Kenya kwa kuweka rasilimali zao na wakaendelea vizuri sana na hii huwa inaendeleza katika uchumi ya Kenya geographically we are in a solid position where we are we have the port we have all that and we are a hub can we become a better hub or well, the ultimate goal and objective of vision 2030 is to create a middle income country in which all Kenyans can live a prosperous life not ostentatious by any means but prosperous
And that means that we need all the other aspects of Vision 2030, not just the economic. Accessing the regional markets can be a challenge because of the policy environment. Uh, Non-tariff barriers that you encounter on a day-to-day -day as you do business can be uh, a challenge to, to Kenya, the East African community. I am on a day-to-day -day, uh, confronted with quite a number of youths uh, looking for employment and uh, I am not able to employ them. Uh, it really is a very needy situation that we need to address as a country because we have quite a big population of youths. Uh, one thing I know is that we stopped teaching art and design in primary school, and I don't know why. We have to look at what the youth is interested in, and we also have to look at how to cultivate these interests from a younger age. We all operate in different areas. For me, in the private sector, I'm more involved in the economic uh, pillar. There are those who are involved in the social pillar, there are those who are involved in the political pillar. And so if we take our roles, I think we'll be able to accomplish Vision 2030.
from being mwananchi um, to being mwenye nchi, the owner of the country. The next phase was celebrating Kenya and then beginning to turn the negativeness away. And there's a negativeness that tends to bring in division. Kenyans are very good when there's something positive. When we win a medal, we all come together and we really need to focus on being positive. So to Shangilie Kenya came around and most of you have heard that, that song to Shangilie Kenya that is now part of the national fabric. And the next stage from March 2013, November to March, was basically talking about our responsibilities as individuals, which was called Wajibu Wangu. And from 2015, November 2015 to 2017, we now started talking about national values, accountability, transparency, and the leadership ethos. So this was now around Wajibu Wetu. So going from my responsibility to our collective responsibility as a nation. And you can see the evolution in terms of, of how this was coming through. And who are the stakeholders in Kenya Daima? It is inspired by the private sector, but it is for all Kenyans, bringing together various stakeholder groups, including the business community, civil society, religious leaders, media, youth, and women leaders. So it brings all everybody together. And because of that, it is not owned by somebody. It is owned by all of us together. What have we achieved in that time? If you look at our achievements over the period of time that Kenya Daima has been, in, has, has been alive, we had a launch in 2012. We had, and that, after that, soon after that, we started the debates, um, governatorial debates, the presidential debates. We had meetings with media owners, meeting with youth reps, development partners, religious council, all those various constituencies, we began to meet regularly to discuss what it is that we want for our country. And some of the other past achievements, and this is key in the Kenya Daima um, appeal, is that peace is at the heart of successful elections. And what we've done every election is to get our leaders and the citizens of this country who are willing to do so to sign the peace pledge. But more importantly, the leaders, because they are the ones who can make the biggest appeal for peace during the time when they are involved in electoral campaigns. So the Kenya Daima 2022 has three pillars. First is a leadership, is a political pillar that talks about leadership and governance. The second one is the economic pillar that talks about a people-centered and economy-led manifestos. And that's what you're hoping to hear today from our uh, gubernatorial uh, uh, candidate, um, Polika. And then the social pillar, which is the peaceful elections and the smooth transition into um, what we'd like to see as Kenyans. So <clears throat> we seek to build more on the Wajibwangu and Mr. Chenda Wajibtu from Wajibwangu, which is my responsibility, to actually doing, quote, quote, my responsibility. Nita Tenda Wajibwangu. I will exercise my responsibility. And that is partially in voting, in making sure that your vo voice is heard when people approach you politically. So what about, what's the political pillar, the leadership and governance pillar? It's all about influencing the choice of leaders based on chapter six of the constitution of Kenya and experience and good performance. So we have to be careful about the leaders that we choose. And a good leader, as far as you're concerned, exhibits selflessness, respect for people, objectivity, integrity, accountability, openness, and honesty. To get the right leadership in place, we have to participate in electing transformative leaders who embrace those ideals. The economic pillar. This requires people-centered and economy-led manifestos and focus and address the aspirations of the country and its citizens and deliver on these aspirations whilst taking Kenya where it needs to be on a global platform. It's not just about doing things for Kenya as Kenya is, but it's about making Kenya grow bigger. 
focus on global competitiveness and economic development, and then getting Kenyans to interrogate political manifestos, understand what leaders are promising to deliver, and most important, which we do not do, hold them accountable to their commitments. Too often we hear about elections, a lot of promises are made, and then Kenyans go back to business as usual. And we, we don't see change. It's because we do not hold our leaders accountable. And then finally, the integration of technology and um, blockchain systems to improve efficiencies in the current systems, especially the public systems that are giving us service so that the delivery of public service is done smoothly. And the last one is a social pillar, which is about peaceful elections and smooth transition. And this is around signing the peace pledge to declare that to support and elect purposeful leaders, leaders of integrity, rise to the challenge of improving the lives of Kenyans, take ownership and responsibility that will help my them still apply to us today. And then the key thing is around not being party to hate speech, incitement, ethnicity, or any other form of violence, whether it's verbal, physical, or written. And that one is what we want our political leaders to sign up to, the peace pledge, and all of us as well who are involved in that process. So how far have we gone so far this year? We had the launch of the Kenya Daima campaign. We've had engagements with the various electoral management bodies, the IPOA, the ORPP, IEDC, and all those others. We have had an engagement on leadership practices. Dr. I had dinner with um, Her Excellency Ellen Sully, the past president of Liberia. And then we've had stakeholder engagements with all the various partners, civil society, religious leaders, youth, private sector, and social media partners. And then we had an engagement with the leader of the Azimio La Umoja coalition. And then we also, and we presented them the private sector manifesto to his ex right honorable Raila Odinga. We also had a presentation of the private sector manifesto to the Kenya Kwanza Alliance, led by His Excellency Dr. William Ruto. We've also had engagements with the AU Comesa ESC Election Observer Mission, the Pre-Election Assessment Mission, with the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute, and also engagements with the, with the NDICC, led by Dr. Matiangi. And you can see all the other engagements that we've had um, with media um, and various, um, various influencers, social media, traditional media, newspapers, so there's a lot going on in terms of Mkenya Daima. And what is it? It's a call to action to achieve the desired end results. Going from me, ni Mkenya Daima. Jaya jibu wangu ni nini? Mimi ni Mkenya, wajib, uh, Mkenya Daima. Ni wajibu wangu. And we have all those kupiga kura, kuchagua biongozi bora, na kuhimisha amani. Good leadership and accountable governance in place for a prosperous, thriving, and peaceful economy. At the end of it, Mimi ni Mkenya Daima. Mr. Tenda wajibu wangu. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what Mkenya Daima is to all of us. Thank you. So... Thank you, just give me a minute. Media wants to set up. You can smile to your neighbor. Mwuzi kama mesha. Tosheka kidogo. Bado kuna chakula. Ili tuendele na mkutano wetu. Tuko sawa sasa. Kuendele na mkutano wetu. Thank you very much, Engineer Bath, for the presentation. I think we've all listened to it and started asking ourselves, wow, August 9th is here. What do we expect and what do we want to see? And what is my responsibility? Because we have responsibilities as citizens of the country 
and we also have responsibilities as institutions of this country to deliver our mandate. And with that one, there's something that Engineer Bath said. You remember he referred to Olympics, right? He mentioned about whenever there's a Kenyan, we all say we are Kenyans and we all smile when we see them run. And for your information, is that today, the 23rd of June 2022, it is the Olympic day. We are celebrating Olympics. And the theme of the day which is in line with the day is that together for a peaceful world. Don't you think it is in line with our aspirations? Yeah. Yes? So with that, I want us to say, Mimi ni Kenya daima, nitatenda wajibu wangu. That's the commitment we wish to see from everyone today. Tuko tayari. Let us go. Mimi ni Kenya daima, nitatenda wajibu wangu. So please remember the three items that you're supposed to do. Vote, get a good leader, and do Misha Amani, because we want on 10th August we could come here and celebrate and continue with our life as if nothing happened, because the election will be a normal day. And to end that session, I want us to clap from where our leader comes from. A minute. We will clap this way. One, two, three, but I will lead. You ready? Yes. Achiel. A Rio, a Dek, a Nguyen, a Santa Sun engineer. At this moment, I would wish to welcome our chair, Ms. Flora Mutahi. Please come and speak to us. Let us celebrate as she comes on stage. Karibu Sana. Good morning. Um, I think, Polly, I can say it's great to have you with us. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we are preaching to the converted. We've walked this journey. Polly and I were actually inducted at KAM at the same day. Maybe 10 years ago? It was a long, long time ago. And um, he obviously became chair before I did, and I followed in his footsteps. Uh, we, we did a lot with Kepsa. He has gone that way, and um, I guess I'm still here, so who knows? <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. And I think um, as, as, as we were working with Polly also through those years, the statements he made, and they are two very profound ones, and I think we use them all the time. I don't know if he coined them or he had had them. Number one was we always must speak truth to power. Because if you look at even the peace pledge that was there last, he was the one holding it the hardest and taking it and saying, sign here. We are not going to be scared for it to, to ask you, A, to sign the peace pledge, or two, to challenge you. And the other one you used to mention a lot was um, politics is too important to leave to politicians. And that's really what we are doing here in the room. Of course, as you know, we are here um, as, uh, presenting our manifesto, telling you what we want to see, because we've seen a lot of brokenness, we've seen a lot of promises, and nothing is, has, has been happening. I mean, um, she was challenging us and saying we need to hold our our leaders to account. But I think we also need to lend our minds to how do we do that? Because Polly, if we were to enter that office, we know the phone number might change. We know the secretary might change. We know all of a sudden it will be like, I hear you, I'll call you back. How do we also on this side of the, the divide really make sure that we keep a very close connection and we can do something to, some, to, to, to the leadership that we have? So I think that is a challenge I shall leave to you um, this morning. So because, Polly, I know you're a historian and an economist, I just want to leave you with a fun fact about this, this county that you're going to take into your hands. It began about 130 years ago. The, um, the whole city was just about a swampland where the Maasai community would actually come to water um, their livestock. So it was all a swamp. And in order to access Uganda from Mombasa, the British colonies actually set up a railway that passed through this swampland called Nairobi. And of course, you know Nairobi means, it's a Maasai word that means the place of cool waters because it, it was really a swamp. And as a resupply station, that is where the whole city foundation began. The first railway really warehouse came, came into life in 1913 along Kenyatta Avenue Loita, and that would later be called Kipande House in 1951. Quite a sad story because this is where they used to issue Africans with identification cards called Kipandes. 
and it was meant to monitor the African movement, an era that Kenyans called the, Kima, the Kipande system. And why I'm calling it a sad story is it was, it, it, we actually used to wear this identification card around our like, necks like a cowbell, um, which was after inserted with a, with, with, with a bronze pass for the holders. And this is how they actually used to know the Africans are passing by. So in, 20, in 1907, Nairobi replaced Mombasa as, as, the, as the capital. Oh, so, sorry, in, um, Nairobi replaced Mombasa as the capital of the East African Protectorate. protectorate. And in 1919, Nairobi was declared to be a municipality. With those few, so you, that is the past. We are living the present. And one of you will be taking us into the future. All the best, and I wish us good deliberations. Thank you very much, our chair, Flora Mutahi. And from her speech, there's something that she has spoken about. And through her, as our chair, allow me to request all the chairmen that are present in the house and the directors that have worked directly with Mr. Polly Kapigade to please stand up to celebrate them. And even Moshimiwa at Wetafadali Simama. Because you're once a director. Yes. Yes. All the directors within the business community, our chairman, we celebrate you. And I will mention their names and then we will all do a clap to celebrate the leadership that we have today. We have on my left Mr. Nick Nesbitt, is our former chair. We have our director, Nanza Trusty. We have Mr. Francis Mujoki, we have our director, Engineer James Mwangi, we have the Kepsa Chair, uh, the Kepsa Foundation Chair, Engineer Obath with us, we have our CEO, Ms. Carol Kariuki, thank you very much. We have to my right, we have Mr. Mushai Kunyiha, who is also our director, definitely our chair, Ms. Flora Mutahi, our chairman, yes, that works, and then definitely our, one of our directors, Mr. Polycap Igade. Let us celebrate all of them because indeed. That is the true honor of being leaders. We truly celebrate you. And to end that session, because we are people who celebrate diversity, and just to clap in four again. And four is very significant because to us, we give it to the highest level of leadership. So four is a significant number. You're waiting for the language, right? Mkotayari? Aya, lakini ya tutaenda central, nataka ni wapeleke kidogo. Kwa vile leo ni siki wakimbiaji. Nataka tufike uko, sindiyo? Sawa. Aya, tuende, aenge. Aenge. So, mo, angwan. That is to you, our chair. And you can continue. So, we now invite our CEO, Ms. Carol Kariuki, to present the private sector manifesto. Karibu CEO, let us celebrate as she comes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's really nice to be in a private sector meeting. Because Polycap is one of us. So I don't have to go into protocols and all that. And so it's really nice and just feels like at home. But before I begin our manifesto and what we are aspiring for Nairobi, and this is just a brief of our aspirations. And since uh, Polly was with us for the longest, he knows our structured engagements. So we don't want to be disturbing him with the phone if he gets to office. We want to be able to have a structured engagement where we know on a quarterly basis or bi monthly we are meeting with the county and having an engagement, then we can keep his phone for the rest of the public who will be disturbing every day. But before I start, I want to tell you two things, or three things, that remind me when we say Polly, Polly Cup of the Man. Na jivunia sana kwa mkenya kwa sabu nchi ya amani. Na eza tembea, Kenya yote, bila kusunguliwa. Yeah? So, then Polly Cup became one of our directors, and we said no. Kepsa has grown. That can't be our logo. And he came up with a brilliant idea. I don't know how many people know what this logo me what this logo stands for. You know, it's really about that Kepsa. Remember, we are an umbrella body, bringing all of you, the associations and the corporations together, and we all interact with each other. Then we are all different sizes. That's the reason why we also have all the different colors to symbolize all our different sizes. Then we are all interact. We all interact globally. You know, when you think about Kepsa and our work we do, 
it's not just about Kenya. We go around the world. We are steamed around the world. We engage around the world, and that's the green that symbolizes that. And so that's one of the things Polika left for us. You know, so thank you, Pauline. Thank you. We left a good mark. The second thing I just wanted to show you, of a second thing that uh, Polika left for us, if that photo could come. We had cute them. Okay, it's not Mushai. <laughs> They've lost it. <laughs> then we cued it very well yesterday. Okay, I will go because I don't know where it is. <laughs> So the second, the second thing which I really wanted us to have, anyway, was uh, Amboseli, when we were discussing Kenya Daima. Know what Polycap did? He went to the, what was it called, musical? The Kenya Music Conservatoire. 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 Yes, the Permanent Presidential Music Conservatoire. And he looked for all those old songs that for the longest time, we used to think they belonged to the Kanu regime. But when you listen to them, they're actually very patriotic. And so he made us listen to like 10 or 15 of them. And out of that, we all voted to the song today we sing of Kenya, Kenya Daima. And he made sure that he worked very closely with Scanard and everyone until we produced the song. And so today, when, and we made sure it was sung around the country in all media houses. And what's so amazing, he not only left it for us as Mkenya Daima, but the country. If you look at the current administration from 2013, the one song that never misses in any celebrations is the Mkenya Daima song. But before that, we all associated it with a former regime until we listened to it and realized, no, it's about us and our greatness. And I hope after this we'll play it as you see it plus the picture. So the team there, please be loading it so that you see it. And those are the days we spent cold nights, both in Mount Kenya and Amboseli, to bath Mkenya Daima. And so a big hand to Polika for that. Another thing. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention again is when we were signing the peace pledges in 2017. And uh, for those who are there, I will not give the story because many remember what we went through in Mombasa that time. And the president finally came. And when he came, we discussed, and Polika presented about Mkenya Daima, and made sure the president, I don't know if that picture is still there. I think we had queued it also last night. So I don't know where it is, but it's OK. I'm sure it will be shown at some point. Um, he made the president sign. So the peace pledge that you see as highlighting as part of our Mkenya Daima presentation was signed by His, Ex His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta. And Polika played that. So just a few things, there he is, as he made sure the president signed the peace pledge, and that's what we and made sure that we use that to make other leaders to sign on the peace pledge. So just a few tips. You did a lot, Polika, for us, but just wanted to highlight some of those three areas that are very diverse, but also very relevant to our conversation today. So thank you. So going into my presentation, and I'll move very quickly. I won't go into a lot of the introduction because I said I'm preaching to the converted. So sorry, Polika, for the team that you have come with. The ones who don't know Kepsa, they'll have to go and read a little bit, at least on the website, because I won't go into the details. But let me just say, over the last 15, uh, 18 years, Kepsa has been able to bring the private sector together and provide leadership in policy and legislative advocacy, but also the whole economic development and country development in the country. And so we bring around 90 business associations and over 200, 450 corporates, but we also host ICC Kenya. And through ICC Kenya, we're able to reach at least work, if we need to, 45 million businesses around the world. And that's what gives us the global impact because we have a big reach of people we can work with around the world. As I said, we work on very structured engagements. And so I will not go through that. Again, I will circulate this for those who don't have it just to see how we are, we are organized and why we work on a structured engagement. And people say, why don't you just meet the government or whoever you need to meet on ad hoc? You can never measure anything on ad hoc. You need to be structured, work on a document, and that's why we develop the national business agenda. So these manifestos are all going into the national business agenda. So that when we say holding your leaders accountable, 
on our structured engagement, we will engage them on these things that we presented to them so that when um, they say they don't remember, we remind them we'll have the pictures of today and many meetings that we'll have after this so that we continue to engage them and be able to measure. Right now we are finishing our National Business Agenda 3 and that's what we'll be doing as a scorecard for this administration that has just, um, is just winding up in the next less than two months. So Nairobi County, and we've heard the history of Nairobi County from our chair, is home to 10% of Kenya's population and also has the largest contribution to the economy and immense potential. Let me give you a few more facts. The Nairobi's output in Kenya shillings is 3.2 trillion, which is 97% equivalent to Kenya's national budget, 2022-2023. As of 2020, Nairobi is estimated to have contributed an average of 27.5% to Kenya's GDP over the last eight years. If Nairobi were a country, its GDP per capita would be more than 500,700 USD dollars. That's what makes Nairobi. And when people ask, why are you not meeting Machakos, Kitui, Kakamega? It's not that we don't want, we will meet them. But this is where we have to start because of these facts. Compare Nairobi with just a few other counties. Nairobi, Kiambu, Mombasa, Nakuru, and Machakos. If you have, um, I'll read the numbers just because of uh, ensuring those who are online and may not see it. 27.5% is Nairobi contribution. Kiambu is at 5.9. And then Mombasa is at 5.2. Nakuru at 4.9. Machakos at 3.4. You can see where Nairobi is. So you cannot play with this city. You cannot play with this county. We really have to protect it and make it grow. So repositioning Nairobi as Africa's economic and financial capital is the title of our economic manifesto. The vision of the private sector economic manifesto is to make Nairobi a livable city. So we're looking at five areas, competitive city, green city, inclusive city, resilient city, and safe city. So the under competitive cities, mobility and transport, integrated urban and land use, pl use planning, water, waste, water, uh, water, waste, water, and solid waste management, healthcare, safety, security, and disaster risk management, e-government, compliance and enforcement, competitiveness and jobs, social cohesion and cultural belonging. And I hope uh, Patrick will have a moment to share some of two of the dreams he had of what we can do around this, because we really need to make this a cultural center. People go to New York in the concrete jungle for tourism. Can you imagine what we have in this city and what we can make it to be a tourist? Then on the appendix, which I'll not go into, are the cross-cutting enablers. That's a deepening technology and innovation, digitization skills and capacity building, planning and coordination, cohesion policies and institutions, business and financing partnerships. That's an appendix, so I'll not present today, but it's all there in the documentation. So let me move to transport and mobility, the intervention areas to enhance urban mobility, because a city it's about movement, goods, people. If we can't move, we can't work. We can't do anything. So the first thing we need to do is technology. Deploy urban mobility solutions and digital technology for traffic monitoring and management. We need to remove our police force, our police service from flagging vehicles, from getting you to move, and let them go and manage security. And to avoid the extortions and traffic mismanagement. Because we know they can only see what they are seeing right there. They can't tell everywhere else. And that creates all the congestion that we see. So establish and fully equip the traffic management center and use of installed CCTV, intelligent transport system for traffic management. Then the integrated national transport plan. We're talking about earlier about an integrated city. So this whole idea of there's a couple lot here, I build my hotel. There's a couple lot here, you know. We need to integrate the city. The same thing on the transport side. It can't be the matatus run on their own, the buses run on their own, the trains run on their own. Everything needs to be integrated. And that's where the mass rapid transit system it was developed many years ago. And those who have been here for the longest in, in Kepsa, remember 2005, 2006, the many years we spent in the Ministry of Transport working on this. It's about time we get it right. Tanzania has it, Ethiopia has it. I don't know what we are waiting for. And I'm sure uh, the rest of our neighbors are on track. So the, the, the bus rapid transit system, commuter rail system, and non-motorized transport system. 
know what is so sad, Polycarp? Our two former governors, both of them, we saw their photos and videos of them going to benchmark on, in countries about BRTs. But here we are today, we still don't have. We are hoping our third governor will not do the same and go and benchmark and we'll still not have a BRT system. <laughs> Financing. Partner with the private sector to create infrastructure for non-motorized transport in order to address the burgeoning demand for better access in the city. Key infrastructure needed include a network of high quality walking and cycling facilities, bike sharing programs, bike parking, and storage facilities. Today, if you bike to town, there's nowhere to store your bike. You either move it with you to the office because you will not find it downstairs. So we can't really bike. Integrated urban and land use planning intervention areas for optimized. Actually, didn't go into the economic benefits, but you can read them there um, in, the, in the form of uh, uh, slide. But on the integrated urban and land use planning, technology again. We're in the tech uh, generation. We're in the tech revolution. Everything needs to move tech. If we don't move tech, we'll be left behind by the rest of the world. So in addition to the cadastre of Nairobi, deploy integrated tools to combine GIS data and big data analytics from the cadastre, public and private land, recreation and cultural spaces in a centralized way to optimize urban planning. So everything needs to be connected, but everything can be done on tech now. We don't need to do paper like we did before. Land banks. Thank you. Land banks, proactively create land banks and avail them to the private sector for industrial and affordable housing development through PPP model. There's a lot of government land. And we know as long as it stays idle, we know what happens. We find that uh, people own uh, private um, title deeds for those lands. So let's develop it. And we can do it together by having those use of that, those land banks. Then zoning. This is my pet, my pet subject because I feel so sad when you travel around the world and you see organized cities and organized towns. And then you come and see the mode of development of where we are going as a city. And whatever happens in Nairobi gets to move to every other town. So you can see every small town that's mushrooming now, mushrooming the same way. Disorganized everything everywhere. And this is where we're saying first, innovate the depleted recreational spaces and parks. We're glad there's a lot of work that's happening with... Um, with the, with, with, the, with the national government and the, and, and, and the county, but we want to move to everywhere and look at all those depleted spaces. And I've, 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 we've seen you, Polika, moving to all the different corners of this city, so I'm sure you, you've seen those things, so you know exactly where they are. Downtown conversion to create proper walking spaces and outdoor sitting spaces for restaurants. Can you imagine the countries that have winters and bad summers, have eating spaces, and they can't wait for a warm so they can sit outside? We have the sun 24-7, 365 days. Yet most of our indoor sitting places, if you go into the downtown city, I don't even know how many you can sit outside, if there's any. It's about time we made our city walkable, a tourist, um, tourist uh, for, the to for tourists, and to be able to make it generate income for the city and revenue and jobs for the young people. Zoning of residential versus office spaces, industrial shopping areas with different regions of the city and county to avoid congestion and security. Again, as I said, if you move now, any development comes, kiosks come from everywhere, um, matatu stop everywhere, wa car washing there everywhere, you put a, car a, a, a matatu parking, it becomes a car wash. We can't have that. What we're saying, people want to do business and we want to create those jobs, but we have to be organized. I need to, I think in this area, maybe the closest here, maybe it's uh, maybe Kileleshwa. I need to know, if I go to Kileleshwa, this is a residential area. This is a shopping area of Kileleshwa. And it has the restaurants, it has the market, it has the car washes, it has everything. But not everywhere, everything um, and that. And also when we, we, we bring up downtown to livelihood and restaurants, people will move away from putting bars and restaurants from the neighborhoods. And save the county, the nights they have to do going to close bars because of noise, and extortions that happen, as we all know, that's what will happen because we will know that I can walk to the city and do and go to the bars and go to the restaurants on areas. Look at Kijabe Street, which is not so far from us. It's a beautiful area that we can create little restaurants. People can walk. There's the there's the and they can go into the um, the theater there, the hotels. It's it's we can do things in this city that will really transform it. And then promotion. 
res uh, residential areas to be built through the master spatial plan, creating catering for all sp spaces, low income public housing. Government cannot run away from this. There's no way we can build even affordable housing for everyone. There are people among us. As you said, it's an inclusive city. Everyone needs to feel included. Every big city in the world that has moved ahead has public housing. There are people who will never afford, so we have to give them public housing. Then affordable housing for those who can afford a little through PPPs, and then commercial housing for the many who are in this room, and so that everyone is catered for in this city, and we stop the mushrooming of mabatis and, and everything else that create a hazard for fire, which I'll mention later. Then promotion of a green city, as I mentioned, ensure all restoration of the Nairobi River as part of our sustainable environment plan to turn the Nairobi River and its tributaries as places of recreation, concerts, walking along, relocate people squatting, uh, by relocating people squatting on sewer lines since there are problems in efforts of the Nairobi river, river cleaning. We want to be able to walk along the river. We need to have the concert outside. I said we have sun 365 days. Why should we have a concert? I like the hotels, but it's about time we started having concerts outdoors and by the riversides, by the tributaries and all that. Then water and wastewater management. The first thing is access to sufficient quantity and quality water. I don't know if Polycap remembers this when in his short stint as a deputy governor. Remember the blue trucks? And we had agreed that every time you see a blue truck, take a picture, send it to you so that we deal with them. We pray and we hope you're you back there and we will not see the blue trucks again. But we need to be able to develop new sources to increase uh, quantity through dam and an integrated systems to manage urban water supply and wastewater systems and ensure they are handled efficiently and intelligently. Technology again, we can handle everything through technology. Water harvesting. Our rains come and we all complain about flooding our roads. Review city bylaws on water used to reduce borehole drilling rates allow water harvesting, but the rates in terms of boreholes, it's also not that everyone gets to, 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 to drill a borehole, like we've seen that's what's happening. Allow water harvesting and introduce a compulsory requirement for contract, con, contractors to include water harvesting as part of their housing and building designs. Sewage systems, develop sewage systems for proper channeling of wastewater and proper treatment, because some of that water can be recycled and can be used. Adopt smart solutions for wastewater management based on real-time data Adopt meter zoning system and institute regulatory frameworks to address the water cartels. Those pictures are to show you what we have and where we can go. You know, and it's not rocket scientists because these are real photos taken from places where this is happening. And what will happen for the private sector overview is supply of reliable and potable water to urban residents alongside wastewater and drainage networks are a basic service that cities need to provide in recent years due to climate change impacts, aging infrastructure, and growing water demand due to urbanization and increasing household incomes, smart technologies can be deployed to address these challenges. So again, back to smart technologies. A case study, and I'll give you this, a pilot program on how to use uh, smart de uh, devices for drinking water management in Dakar, Bangladesh. And the reason why we picked Bangladesh is because it's not a, a, diff a very different country from us. Because if I pick a country from Europe, you'll say, you know what, thousands of years of development, they can do that. This is in Bangladesh, could offer insights on this, how technologies was used to monitor their city water network for leaks and to ensure that clean, uh, pressurized water was delivered 24 hours a day to all residents. This enhanced capacity of water utilities and increased the operational of, of efficiencies and financial stability. So Polycap, if there's any one country you'll visit for this, Bangladesh, not a European country. For the economic benefits, integrated water and waste management will improve the overall health outcomes and access to water for industries and over 60% of households who have no continuous access to them. I'm sure many of you seated here buy water. Water of drinking, you know, remember the taps? You used to drink water from the taps? I don't know who any, any more does that. So, as I said the other day, it's only in Kenya where we say we used to have, now we don't. Most countries say we didn't have, now we have. So it's about time we started saying we have, we didn't have. You know, this will increase the county revenue and curb the infiltration of water cartels. Again, back to the water cartels. On solid wastewater management, and I move here, circular economy. We are all talking about circular economy, climate change, and all that. Implement countable, uh, county sustainable water management action plan and establish aerobic composting plants to manage organic waste. Look at our waste and what we can do with our bin. It's about time to bring back Camero. For those who grew up in the city of Nairobi and remember about Camero, 
you know, we need to be able to have our garbages collected. I pay my taxes for my garbage to be collected. But today I pay my taxes, then I pay my security guard, I pay for someone to collect my bag garbage, you know, so we need to move back. I'd rather pay an extra tax and knowing I'll get the services of the city. Waste collection, technology again, adopt smart waste management systems and devices such as smart bins, smart trucks, and robotic sorting to ensure the sustainability of this sector. Recycling, establish color-coded waste uh, receptacle, respectable and material recovery facilities at the ward level so that we, we decentralize. Just private sector overview, solid waste management is a documented threat to health and environment. An estimated 2,400 tons of solid waste is generated every day, only 20%, and 20% of which is in plastic form. Of the waste generated by the city, only 45% is recycled, reused or transformed into a form which can, be, can yield an economic or ecological benefit, a far cry from the 80% target by the National Environment Management Authority, um, uh, NEMA. This is where we want to get at least to 80%, not even 100% for now. Case study is easily 48% of residents indicated that they discard waste along the road in heap and drainage. Further, 35% indicated putting waste in dustbins, which eventually ends up in the undesignated areas. Challenges related to waste management include infrequent, irregular waste collection, illegal dumping, low levels of information on poor waste disposal, and lack of concern among the residents. This is again a big problem. And our policy and say, you know, one of the challenges that the citizens have, and here we're speaking as citizens because we're speaking to our political leadership, is that when government decides to do anything, they put a bylaw or a law, today they start enforcing tomorrow. So there's no, first the systems have not been put in place, there's no education to the citizens before you start enforcing. And so people react because first they don't know, there's no system in place, and then also there's no education to tell them why the waste is bad for environment, why it's bad for their health, and what it does to productivity of the people if they are permanently sick in the hospitals, and the cost of government to deal with health issues. Healthcare systems, which is my next. Intervention areas for efficient healthcare systems. Leverage on technology to provide innovative healthcare solutions. Support telemedical services or e-health to ensure there's remote monitoring of health situations in the county and proper management of county health assets. I think for those who watched, I think it was Monday, when they had an expose of the NMS uh, hospitals, they've done a great job. But you also had some of the complaints of some of the hospitals that the, um, the team went, the media team went to, where they would, the, the people they would find that the place is empty, they'd be told because there's no medicine, or you need to, okay, you can see the doctor, but you know, we need to go and see the t do a test outside, and then come back again, see the doctor, then go and buy medicine and all that. This is what we, we, we can start working together with private sector and strengthen innovation around affordable health insurance, like micro-insurance to the uninsured to complement NHIF. Private insurers can also be incentivized to partner with the county in rolling out insurance schemes. And we can think about, as I said, it's about inclusivity. This city is about inclusivity, not only those who can afford to live in the city. Preventive services build a comprehensive early warning system to detect and trigger prevention measures and provide tailored preventive services to the citizenry. I think we've done well with COVID, and a lot of diseases, especially just um, uh, the, the usual diseases, were managed because we started following some rules. So no matter what we do on the curative side, if we don't do something about prevention, we'll always, we'll not have enough. The burden on government, the burden on the private sector, we cannot afford ensuring our employees, the government cannot afford to treat all of us if we don't go to preventive measures. Then we can do the curative measures by strengthening access, availability, and affordable public health care services, offering the such as maternity services, as has been mentioned, has been really good, and specialized treatment facilities like cancer diagnosis and treatment. And then going back and saying, why are we seeing all these cancers? And move back to prevention again, because curative will never be the solution. Capacity building measures train the health practitioners to ensure sufficient medical personnel, recruitment of staff, to enhance staff to patient ratio. We're seeing a lot of our nurses still leaving the country for better opportunities. How can we incentivize them to make sure that we have enough here also? Initiate PPPs in development of healthcare facilities, collaborate with the private sector in medical research. Again, the private sector wants to be involved in research. And this is where we bring academia. This is a city that holds most of the 
academic institutions in the country. If we did that between the private sector, the county government and the academia, we can do a lot of research in this area. Then safety and security. Every city is rated of its uh, livability by its security and the safety. Back to technology. Work collaboratively with the Interior Ministry of Police, County Ascaris, and, and private security agencies. Apply digital solutions to expand real-time surveillance. We know the constraints government has, but all of us here, our offices, our homes, have private security. If we integrated that system, again going back to an integrated county, we integrate the city, we integrate the county in every way, whether it's security, whether it's development, whether it's cultural, we will start seeing the city and the county that we are talking about so that we can share that information on law enforcement, management, response to emergencies. Because if you hear of a fire, sometimes it, all you need to do is that because you know that security guards who guard a certain place in an industrial area, you can call them, you can tell them to, what to do, they can give you the information you need. So as a county, as you're getting to the ground, you have all the information that you need to have. Full implementation, and here I gave a, a good example of the Huruma accident once, when there was a, a, a building fell and it was raining crazy. And we couldn't reach government. And uh, Red Cross called us and said, Carol, we need to do something. It's 7 p.m. We're going to lose too many people. I remember calling Engineer Matu then. He was the, the chair of the, um, of the infrastructure sector board. And I asked him, where do you know construction is happening around Eastlands? And he said, um, the road, um, what's that big road called now? It's, uh, which is Duo? The Outer Ring Road. And he said, There's a ch the Chinese contractors are on ground. We called them and they got to the site before we could mobilize government. And they started removing the debris. By the time government was getting there and arguing between the county, the national government, the military who is in charge, would have lost many more people. And by morning, government had taken over. But we were proud that we could be part of that. But we can do more together if we're integrated. We are to, uh, because if there's equipment nearby and something is happening, we should be able to know as private sector and send our people in there. Uh, full implementation of the recently launched national addressing system. I think we've talked about this for a long time. So seeing the president launch this two days ago was a big milestone. So we want to see the full implementation. I gave again an example again about uh, Arusha. You go to the villages in Arusha and even the small huts are numbered. This really helps with security because you know everything. I don't know who watched news yesterday and saw this um, young man who the landlord went to lock the house because he hadn't been paying rent and found 22 guns and 529 um, bullets in that house. He couldn't pay rent, but this is what he had in Kilimani. So part of this na whole national address system is you know who lives where, you know. And then when you're giving services, if there's water that needs to get to Westlands, you, because you have the numbers of the number of the buildings, the number of the houses there, you know how much water needs to be pumped there. This is the whole idea of the national address, addressing system. Rehabilitation of street families, an inclusive city again. As we said, we cannot sit here and we have our brothers and sisters on the streets. So develop shelters and re rehabilitation homes for the street families and relocate them from the city center, but so that then we can integrate them back to the, to the pub, uh, to the, to the, um, to the, to, to, to everyone else. Economic benefits improve security will enhance safety, well-being, and economic outcomes. Better security will also progressively contribute to the 24-hour working economy that we have talked about many times. So bring the system, the, the transport system we talked about, that runs 24 hour, uh, hours, bring the security in, and the economy will work for 24 hours. And that way we'll be able to create more jobs, improve productivity, uh, include product productivity, and create more revenue for the county. The national addressing system will also spur economic growth, particularly in the realms of e-commerce and small and medium enterprises, again improving security, uh, security, distribution of social services, and boost the national planning capacity. Because if there's a department that is almost dead, not only in the county, but in the whole government, is planning. You know, so anyone does whichever. Just need to pay and move, but government can't really plan for the services of the people. Disaster risk management, as I was giving the Huruma case, what do we really need here? Centralized integrated unit, develop integrated multi-hazard early warning systems manned by a centralized unit so that we are not competing on who is in charge. Establish stockpiles for food and non-food items. Many of you remember that, um, again, going to that um, Huduma. We started now, Kepsa became 
the place for everyone to bring their food, the non-food items, and then we could distribute back to Huruma. We need to be able to have a stockpile that everyone can always contribute on a regular basis and then distribute it whenever there are crises. Because crises do happen. We don't plan them. Some of them are natural. There's the man-made ones, and that's why we deal with some of these problems, but there's the natural ones. Develop the city, county hazard and vulnerability atlas. Again, we, when you look at those big countries that are always hit by disasters, they know. You know, you go to a place like uh, Florida and others, you'll always see signs about tornadoes and all that, so that we know where the vulnerabilities in the city are, so that um, even those who are planning to be able to, to support and know, but also when you're going there to invest, you know what you're dealing with and you, you, you know how to prepare better. Funding and budget, allocate and ring fence at least 5% of the county budget for county emergency contingency fund. And this will receive contributions from the exchequer, subventions, private equity, and individual con con contributions because we all live in this city. Disaster Operations Center established and operationalized the county disaster center fully equipped with early warning systems, hazard mapping, disaster mapping. And um, that will start making the city more livable. Moving fast, e-government, we're very excited at what the work we've been seeing happening in the digitization of e-government and really want to celebrate even NMS that um, they, they launched the Nairobi e-service in November 2021, which is primary a revenue collection system and would like to make the following recommendations for, this, for the county, ensure that there's zero downtown, because we know sometimes um, that, is, that happens, and so the system is just not working. For good reasons, sometimes because people are tampering with it. We need to have zero downtown if we are going to run as a city. Ensure it is integrated with efficient and effect, effective e-permitting system for development approval. Ensure it has a grievance redress system. If there's an issue, where do I post my grievance so that those issues can be dealt with? Free internet spot, hotspots, especially in recreation parks, Nairobi, Uhuru Park, Central Park, Mishuki Park, to enable rapid access to information vital for economic and educational development in the county. It also gives a lot of information when people can go into a hotspot in certain places of the city and know where, what's, what's in the city, what they can they go and see and see around. Compliance and enforcement, implement the CAPS, Capacity Assessment and Rationalization of Public Service to address redundancy. The many ghost workers we talk about in the city and capacity issues. Institute civic education and capacity building for the public as a prerequisite for enforcement, which I talked about, that before any enforcement of any law, let's educate the public, then we can, we can, we can enforce. Institute strict uh, regulations on subletting and operations of city food markets and streamline operations without cartels and brokers. That's what kills our markets. And those who are real genuine people in the markets really don't get to do what they need to do. We formed the city inspectorate department through purchase of uniforms, workforce, rationalization, and retooling them. We saw Kerry the other day saying they'll, they'll put cameras on their people. I don't know what the county will do to make sure that uh, their, their county people, when they come to us, we, they, they are being seen. And we are also being seen so that we are not the ones. Remember, there's always a give and a taker so that that's not happening. Establish alternative modern markets for traders and hawkers to move on. Our people want to do business, young and old. Let's give them the markets. The markets are good for them, for their health, for their shelter, for their growth, because we can create value chains, even to export. Then for us as the buyers, we can buy um, healthy food and, um, and, and get um, what we need at, at the right prices. That's really what the markets are for. But those, the, I, sometimes we really watch them. The rains come, they put a little um, plastic thing around them, you know. Then you also wonder where do they even go to the bathrooms, you know, because they're on the streets. You know, it's a health hazard for them and for ourselves. I would, you know, all the economic benefits, I wouldn't even go to that. Towards the end, competitiveness and jobs. Intervention areas of enhancing competitiveness and ease of doing business, improve state standards and value chains of city informal and manufacturing hubs, county government to leverage on the informal manufacturing hubs in Kariobangi, the light industries, industrial areas, Kamukunji area to promote cluster based approach to improve their standards, enhance value chain participation. Again, why we need them in those clusters is because we can do this work and we can do it together, uh, supporting SME development and the acceleration of jobs and wealth creation. Construction of industrial production go-downs for leasing at affordable costs, working on a grant arrangement for re refurbishment of existing production centers, equipping the centers with modern technology, machines and equipment to support innovators, 
integrating these Juakali groups in the county projects such as affordable housing projects. And we know one of the groups that was, was included in this, in, in Kariobangi, and the lives that changed. I've given this example before for those who've had, but I'll just mention here for the sake of um, our um, prospective governor. This group, because of being included in being able to supply the doors and the doorknobs and the windows, their lives changed. They were able to start, they, formed, they were able to form a proper association and form a company because they needed to go to the bank to get, to get money, to get a loan. And once they did that, they were the first occupants on some of those affordable houses because they could afford those houses. Their lives transformed. So what have you done? You've moved them. They were able to become, they started saying they're going to start going to Mombasa by SGR to take their families. They've, you've created a new, a new area of tourism. You know? So that integration for us is very important by getting them into, and this is just one case in housing. We can do that in different industries uh, that uh, the county can, can, can work with us. Promote digital and digitally enabled jobs in partnership with the private sector as a key job source for youth. You know, we are running the AJIRA program. We'd like to do more. We're doing basic, uh, we have uh, what we are calling constituency hubs. If we had a county hub, I think we could do a lot of young people into the digital and digitally enabled jobs. Market linkages for goods produced within the city. Establish forums for trade meetings, partnering with stakeholders in trade exhibitions. I think the national government has done this. We need to do that as county. You know, the trade exhibition so that we integrate uh, uh, the, the, the different traders. Entrepreneurship development, establish county business in co in co incubation hubs as co collaborative venture with national government developmenters and other stakeholders. We know about uh, IHAB and NILAB and others. We can do many more. And marketing of Nairobi National Park. I feel that's one of the things we lose. So we take it in as part of tourism of the national government. This should be a county marketing tool the only city in the world with a national park. Make it one of the things that identifies us as a city. As we said, counties need to be identified with different things. As we're talking about an economic and financial hub of Nairobi, this should be one of your flagship. And people should come here not thinking about going to Masai Mara, but thinking about going to the national park. We had the history. I think some of the history we've not had about the park is people like EABL and where they started in the park and others. We can create those, and those can be marks. Like people are not seeing only animals, but they're seeing the history of what happened in that in that park over time, and becomes and, and becomes a tourist attraction. Implement public-private partnerships um, um, as, as as we need to do, and again structured engagement. As I finish, improving social cohesion and cultural belonging. Most cities, people visit for the culture. You know, they want to go for concerts, they want to go to the theaters, you know. So Nairobi has a lot. We have the park, yes, and we can do. But the culture side of it, develop the Nairobi city value proposition. It's unique value proposition that becomes its unique selling point. Something like what KWDS did with the national parks. Establish happy events, festivals. I talked about Nairobi River and being the concert areas. Creation of national happy event hosted in all counties similar to the Samba Festival in Brazil. Mardi Gras in the U.S. that will call attention to the good things about Kenya. What is our happy event as this county, as this country? Technology. Additionally, consider partnering with the private sector to develop digital reality tools to help increase access to cities' cultural programs. Today we have the private sector ones. I don't know how many get those uh, emails and, and texts. Where is the county one that tells us all the cultural events and where they are happening so that uh, we, can, we can go to them? County sports development, set aside funds to improve the set of sports facilities. We are glad to see what's happening. Gong Road, the, the rugby, sports, and other places, but we can do a lot. One of the things, and as I finish here, when you go to some of these countries with big football clubs, whether it's Madrid or Milan, uh, what is it called? Um, AC Milan and many others. Their sports facilities are also tourism facilities. Because what do they create inside there? You just don't go and see the sports facility, but within it inside, you walk through the journey of what those clubs have done and achieved. And it's such an attraction for tourists. Many of us, I would hardly go to a sports venue to watch a football match, but I go to those places to walk through the tourism and see the journey. You know, where did Messi, where, where he played, what he did, which with the, the, the different sports and the, what they won and everything. It's interesting, the cups, the materials, and, and the development. It's fun to have that. Now, Stadium can be our starting point before we even move to Kasarani. 
you know, and build a tourism center within it. Under it, you don't even need to build anything else. When you see, we all see the, the sports venue, but under it, all around it, inside, is a tourism center and walk in. Because we have, how do we remember Kina Kadenge and others? There's no way. Today's generation, if you ask them about Kadenge, they'll look at you and wonder, who's that? But you should be able to walk in there and see them and how they played and have all these clips of their videos and how they played. So in many words, you can see how our city can become. And I know you're not new. You're a marketer. There is nothing you cannot help us work together with you. And so I'd like the, uh, the appendix has a lot more details, which we'll pass to your team, so that when we start working on our NBA, we'll work together with you. But I'd like to welcome you now, Mr. Kapoli Kapigade, the aspiring Nairobi governor. To also tell us what your vision is, and do, do we have a meeting place with our vision at all? It's so bad. The Kenya Private Sector Alliance, the executive of the Private Sector Foundation, I'm sure there's a foundation, um, all the directors of this great institution, which I have been a part of for very many years, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. You know, when my team and I were preparing to come this morning. I told them I'm going to be amongst friends um, because I'm, I'm, I'm truly part of KEPSA. I was made by KEPSA. A big part of my 26 year history career because I've worked for 26 years. The first day I earned a salary after University of Nairobi was in January of the year 1996 up to March this year. So I have been employed for 26 years, serving different organizations. And this year, I'm personally going to turn, I'm going to celebrate my 50th year. I'm going to turn 50 on, 20, on 21st of September this year, and I will be governor of Nairobi City County. <laughs> and there's a reason why I'm appealing to you to give me a birthday. My 50th birthday present as governor is what I'm about to tell you. But all what I came to told, tell you, you have told me. All, sincerely, all what I came to tell you, Carol, you have told me. My team is sitting there, I think with their jaws dropped. Because all I can tell you is our campaign platform, when I say Nairobi, you say to Navi Itaka. Let me see if you guys can wake up this morning. Nairobi? Nairobi, Nairobi, what you listened to Carol, our CEO, present this morning is the Nairobi as you want it. My role as Polycap and how I have succeeded in my career, rising from a salesman, a management trainee in Coca-Cola, very quickly to becoming a departmental chief before I was even turned 25, to becoming a CEO by the time I was 29. And being a chief executive officer of different multinationals was because I always knew one formula in life. I am hired by shareholders of this organization to serve a customer. And if I serve that customer, that customer will reward the shareholder sustainably over a long time. Now you'll ask what's the relevance of that to politics? Politics, the shareholders are political parties. And I think this is where many in private sector don't get it. Politics, the shareholder in the cycle of life, of governance, you call it the governance pillar, the social pillar, and the economic pillar. The governance of a country, the shareholders, the equivalent of shareholders in private sector in politics is a political party. And I've not heard Kepsa speak enough about operationalization of the Political Parties Act. And pay attention to the construct, design, discipline, hygiene of political parties. 
Now let me tell you a secret about our ticket as Imiola Omoja before I really come to the content of my vision. Because shareholders, let me tell you how it works, and it works in clockwise. Shareholders simply invest in employees or management. Employees invest and serve customers. Customers reward the shareholder. That is how it works. That's how the world goes around. And if you dare go anti-clockwise, shareholders engaging with the customers, and who are the employees in politics? It's elected leaders, and then the people elected leaders appoint to be managers of government, and people employed by the Public Service Commission. Uh, those are cabinet secretaries, PSAs, directors, the guys you go to. And the idea is to then serve the voter who's the public. So you see how the cycle works. But what has happened in Kenya for too long, and what happens to very many businesses that don't last long, and I can say that comfortably, when you see a business where shareholders combine with employees to steal from the customer, what happens? In politics, for far too long, the shareholder, who's the political party, has partnered with government employees, the civil servant, to actually not just steal, rape from the public. Rape the public, that's a word, and I'm sorry for using those words. Carol, I'm going to tell you what we want to do before I really go to what the barrier to what we want to do is. The, but let me pronounce the barrier. The debate in this country is no longer about what needs to be done. The Europeans know what they want. And you have presented it to us. And I hope you have given me permission to innovatively imitate and innovatively steal. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sure you have seen me walk the streets, wash toilets, serve beer, wash cars. In fact, the latest is meme is I, there's something I deliver just in time. <laughs> but why was I doing that? Is to present to the Kenyan that here comes a man and here comes an hour where the politician must come from his high road as a fellow who comes with a chariot, like the way Jesus entered Jerusalem singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Well, the politician is simply a servant of the people. And a city is about service. And the services you have pronounced to us, the services, Carol. So the debate in this country is no longer about what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. That, that's not the debate. It's not even the debate in the Republic of Kenya. The, Repu the biggest debate in this country, I pronounce to you, ladies and gentlemen, is who will do it. It is not what, it is not how, and it's not why it needs to be done. The conversation is about who will do it. So allow my presentation to be a lot more about who, the question of who, the governance pillar of Vision 2030. Because there's no debate about what needs to be done. Because, but, here's the thing. For far too long, because I was part of KEPSA, and thank you very much for letting people know in, um, I'm, I'm sure you'll get into trouble looking like you're campaigning for me, but facts are facts, and truth is the truth. Um, for far too long, we realized when I was in KEPSA that after the 2010 constitution, the Constitution demands the citizen to become an adult, not a child. There was too much parent-child relationship between government and the citizen. So government people actually call people watoto, wana inchi. That's why in Kepsa we decided who, who and most effectively. That is the question, political question of the year 2022. And that's why people are saying, oh, Igade has a very unique campaign. What unique campaign? Igade is celebrating blue-collar work, which is the foundation of a city. A city is made by waiters and waitresses. They are the heart of the cultural thing you have presented here. A city is made of matatu conductors, public sector conductors, ticket givers. A city is made of traffic controllers. A city is made up of, you know, people who do normal work. But especially our media, truly loves this image of the politician who comes down looking like a messiah. I'm not a god. And I love it that you continue to call me Polly. 
because I will never lose my first name. My name is Polycarp Igave. I come to serve you, and that is why Azimio La Umoja is what I truly believe in. It's a unity uh, to come together. So allow me to spend more time talking about the who bit rather than the what and the how. But just in case people think I've just come here without understanding the what, I also want to challenge you as Kepsa. I've told you I'll speak truth to power. And the people who brought the truth to power movement in the world are called Quakers. If you grew up in the Western Kenya, there's a church called Friends. Eh? Those people, if you go to the Friendship Center, they believe in speaking truth to power. And the most powerful people in Kenya are defined in our constitution, chapter 1. Read chapter 1 if you don't read any other chapter. But I also want you to read chapter 4. I'll tell you why. Read chapter 1. Why do I ask you to read chapter 1? It says the power belongs. The sovereign power of the Republic of Kenya belongs to the people. And that's why sometimes you see a contest between politicians and civil servants. And civil servants must know their place. They are delegated authority. The politician is directing fusion of chapter one. And that's why I refuse to be a cabinet secretary. That's why I refuse to be appointed to be chairman of this or chairman of that. That's why I have put myself in front. I have practiced what I preached in Kepsa, Wajibu Wangu, which was the second theme of Mkenya Daima. Wajibu Wangu. You, you know how the soloist, the Pokomo soloist says it in our national anthem. Yeah? It is the second chapter, I believe, of, of our national anthem. Yeah? Na tu jenge taifa letu Have you guys truly taken breakfast? Na tu jenge taifa letu Kenya is the hili heshima What a beautiful prayer. What an amazing invitation to give thanks to God because we've taken responsibility. But the lawyers who wrote our constitution, the characters who wrote our constitution, the fellows who lost our constitution, led us down one tunnel. One critique I have of them, and it's a constructive critique, is they spoke too much about rights. The Bill of Rights is so heavy, which is fantastic. I don't want us to lose it. That's why every year used to be mapambano, mapambano, bado mapambano. You know, we are fighting for our rights. But hakiangu, the other side of hakiangu is wajibu. So Polycarp Igathe has taken responsibility and said I will not complain about a politician anymore. In fact, it's Mukenya Daima that has led me to politics, if you do not know. Many people have no idea that I'm in politics because I was chairman of Mkenya Daima. Because I looked at the level of bandwidth of our politician, it is too low. It cannot download a picture or music. <laughs> <laughs> the character, the competence, the capability of the average politician in this country is way below the national character, the national capability, the national competence. Because all of you love to sit in suits and discuss things at Kempinski. None of you is wanting to roll up your sleeves to come to the political scene and do what I am doing. Because you can't do what I am doing. Why don't you start by voting for me on 9th of August? Can I please, <laughs> can I please ask for your votes on 9th of August? Because you're all scared. You're Mickey Mouses. You have refused to take responsibility, but you continue to just say, it is that fellow, it is that fellow, it is that man. I'm, I told you my subject today is about the whole. Carol, allow me and Chair Flora, my very good friends, and Patrick Obath, and Vimal Shah, yeah? Nesbitt, all of you, Mami, please allow me to challenge you on one thing. Why don't you draw a scorecard when, as a CEO, for the 26 years I worked, I succeeded and I continue to succeed as a CEO because I only used two tools to guide the organizations I mean, and this is what I will do in Nairobi City County. Number one, my manifesto will simply present to you the scorecard of Nairobi, which I want you to hold me accountable to. 
I'm a responsible person. You've given me a long PowerPoint. I was sitting there saying, why don't you hold me to, why don't you convert it to a scorecard? That's what Igade understands. That is the leadership of Igade. What do I mean by a scorecard? One pager that's saying after five years, and will reveal it with you every year, and will only mark you red, green, amber. Green, red, amber. So it's, very, it's a traffic light system. Just how, like the way a city works, you want traffic lights, not a guy controlling. Uh, give me red, take this document, is that my constructive, uh, convert it to a scorecard. A scorecard is how you will know Igathe and Professor Kaloki and Rai Baba na Mama, Raila Molo Dinga and Martha Karua, the Azimiola Umoja, when we come to office, are we succeeding or failing in Nairobi? I just want one page that captures it. And you should do it for the nation. I will take you to all neighborhood association. I'll take you to the informal settlements. They include it. Make sure it's publicly participation. We are asking for a scorecard. How will you judge whether the governor of Nairobi has succeeded or failed on an annual basis? When I walk into an organization as an executive, that's the first question I will ask of Nairobi city county workers. There are 15,000 of them, 350. Nairobi is a county that has existed to pay salaries, not deliver services. It gobbles up 24 billion shillings every year of salaries. But for what? It is a city short of water, caught in between the shortage of water and the stink of garbage and a sewer. Nairobi, it is, let's not, rem let me not go into the problems. I'm talking about the future. What, it is what it is. We have to deal with it. And let me stop blaming the weather. Let me change my clothes. My manifesto is about a clothes change. And the work of a leader is not to cry that cost of living is high. It's actually to reduce it and say I have brought it down. The work of a leader is not to come and pronounce problems, but to pronounce solutions. So the solution I'm asking of you, define an Nairobi County scorecard. And let it not be more than one page, it will be too long. Right? Number two, a scorecard is nothing, it's an output. Give us also a performance agreement which I want to sign with you. A performance agreement is the few things I will do as governor of Nairobi City County every day to deliver the scorecard. So if you like what I am saying, you can hire me after I'm finished as governor after five years to become a chairman or a consultant of your organization. If you're running your business without those two tools, you are flying blind. An organization must have a scorecard and a performance agreement. What is a performance agreement? The few things the governor of Nairobi does to sell the 20, I have to walk in Zimmerman, eh? I have to go to these kiosks, I have to see 20 customers a day. That's the performance agreement. Are you understanding the difference? Performance agreement is what I do every day repetitively to deliver that. Scorecard. So allow me to present to you my performance agreement to you. So we see whether we're in concurrence. Because the performance agreement is what constitutes the Igave Kaloki Manifesto. It has only three things. And the acronym for it is C. Because I think very many of us in Kenya, especially at the higher levels, who we have gone to school, we have the ability to look, but we are lacking the ability to see. To see, you bring more faculty. To look is just a physical thing. Right? You can look at a lady, but you'll never see that she can be capable of being your wife until you see. <laughs> so seeing you have to bring something else. So please remember the acronym C. My performance agreement with Nairobi is C. Number one is S, society. Kustawisha Jami. that's what S stands for. Nairobi is a tale of two cities, hope and despair. Where we are sitting is the land of hope. This, sit, this hotel is sitting in a title land. This hotel is sitting in a green place. Nairobi, when was it? It was Charles Dickens. Nairobi is a, is a tale of two cities. The flower festooned, leafy suburbs. And the deprived, left behind informal settlements. That's what Nairobi is. How many of us actually know the left behind informal settlements? And I submit to you, the flower festooned, treed in, leafy suburbs have only five years to exist if we don't solve the problem of the, the desperation 
the despair in the informal settlement. The informal settlement of Kibra, the informal settlement of Korogosho, the informal settlement of Madari, the informal settlement of Soweto Congo, the informal settlement of Gidogoro, the informal settlement of Kibagari, the informal settlement, um, which one have I left out? Mukuru, Kwa Jenga, Kwa Ruben, uh, and there are very many. The informal settlement of Kawangware. You guys will not be alive in five years unless you vote in a government that balances the equation. You do not have enough electric fences, you don't have enough guns, you don't have enough bullets. Unless you come off your high horses, vote for Igade and Kaloki to start the journey in the next five years of rebalancing the equation of hope and despair. And therefore, I'm presenting to you my first core card. The few things I'll do very well, and I'm calling it in Swahili so that I can be understood, Nikusta Wisha Jami. What are we going to do with society? My scorecard only comprises three things. We promise to deliver zero hunger. We promise to deliver decent jobs. And we promise to deliver well-being, which you call, and it's all captured in your beautiful presentation to us. I have summarized it into three measures of failure and success. Zero hunger, well-being, decent jobs under that theme of society. What is my promise as governor? What is my promise to my fellow colleagues in the private sector? What's my fellow promise to adults who live in Kenya? My promise is, how will we do it? I pronounce a package I call Linda Jami. <coughs> Nairobi has 50,000 households that sleep hungry every day. Last night, there's more than 10,000 single mothers with children who could not feed their children. Those children slept hungry. And maybe the mother had to borrow water. When Raila Mono Dinga talks about Baba Care, other people rubbish it. These 6,000 is needed. I've just come from a job as Group Chief Commercial Officer of Equity. Therefore, I know a little bit more than my competitors because they have never worked elsewhere. They just worked in politics. One of the biggest projects I led, I was in charge of the Equity Group Foundation. I used to transmit to 9,000, equity bank alone, I'm not talking about KCB, Cooperative Bank, and other banks. In equity bank alone, I had 9,000 bank accounts that I used to help the government of Kenya transmit 2,000 shillings cash transfer from government through the Ministry of Social Protection to the household. So when I give you the number 50,000, you are not just getting it from a politician was kissing. What? You're getting it from an individual who knows. A man who's telling you, I'm the man for you in Nairobi. But it's your choice on 9th of August. They sleep hungry. So what are we going to do with Linda Jami? This is my promise to you. Because I don't want to give you a scorecard. Linda Jami is what I do every day, repetitively, to deliver zero hunger. You get the link. What will I do with Linda Jami? If you go on Gong Road today, Gong Road because of Kibra, or you go to Kiambu Road because of Gidogoro, where there is a slum, you'll always see a young kid coming to sell in Jugu Karanga. The, this city, we should be ashamed that all of us allow child labor. We should all be ashamed, all of us. My candidate as governor is to stop that child labor. What will we do? We want food packages, five kilos of rice, five kilos of that, because that is enough, five kilos of rice, five kilos of unga, five kilos, uh, some cooking fat. Basically, a house package, which we give to the mother, we don't give to the father. The mother is the one who knows the child. We will invite the mother to come to school every Friday in primary schools and ECD schools in informal settlements. And the mother will inspect the work the child has done and confirm that that child has attended 90% of the classes. You have to allow 10% because even us, uh, there, is, there is an allowance. And that mother will be given a food package to last her family another two weeks. Vote for us because we shall roll out Linda Jami within the first 100 days we are in office. 
and we will afford to roll out Linda Jami because we shall stop the revenue leakage at Nairobi City County. That's where the financing of this will come from. When I was deputy governor of Nairobi City County, we used to collect 100 million shillings a day of revenue. But what is collected in Nairobi is in excess of 200 million shillings a day. But what gets into the Nairobi books of accounts, I think the best number I've seen, even when I've done my quick research, is 42 million. And it's KRA collecting. Ladies and gentlemen, what am I telling you? It is a thuggery fest. It's a stealing fest. Nairobi is one big live crime scene. And it has been a crime scene for 40 years. Polycap is 49. The crime scene started when I was nine, when Margaret Kenyatta perhaps stopped being the governor of Nairobi. She, when Mar Her Excellency Margaret Kenyatta was the governor of Nairobi, Nairobi even won an award for the cleanest water in the world. That's how UNEP started to come. That's when we were positioned, I liked this positioning of the city, the green city in the sun. And I love chair where you reminded us that this is Ingare, Nairobi. This city was formed because of water and the railway. So we shall fix this city also with the water and the railway. And I'll explain to you. The future of this city is also water and the railway. So society, Linda Jami is a promise we are making. I'm also making a second promise, and I invite you to participate. The laws in Kenya allow you to offer money to charity. And when you offer money to charity, it's tax deductible. I will invite you, together with other people, to launch what I have registered as the Nairobi Foundation. The Nairobi Foundation will be an opportunity to aggregate the balance sheets and the P&Ls of all successful large corporates, medium-sized corporates, to come and do something in Nairobi. Stop doing your small little disaggregated things. I've done very many disaggregated As MD of Vivo Energy, and I can see my friend Waitito here, who was my colleague in Vivo Energy, Vivo Energy is a company behind Shell in this country. Many of you may not know, but we had a 50-year lease when I was in that company, given to us to own close to 30 acres of Karura Forest. That was our private sports club. That is how Nairobi used to be exclusive. The city wrote a 50-year lease, gave it to a private company with only 200 people to play golf, to, eh? to play sports, Next to the UNEP Center, if you go there today, I'm the person who bequeathed those, 50, those 30 acres. I bequeathed that list to the Friends of Karura. And many of you may not know, I also chair the Karura Forest Environmental Trust, KFIT. I'm a friend of Karura Forest. When you talk to me about, not only do we have a national park, we are the only city in the world with 1,000 hectares, 1,000 acres of a rainforest next door to us. Literally, if you go to Sigiroi, you're in a rainforest. We have done nothing to use it to brand the city. If you go to the small building there, you will see a plaque called Vivo Energy. I presented it to London and I said, we must bequeath this back to the city. And it was being stolen. A few people wanted to make a hotel. Patrick Obath is here, and he was a former MD of Shell. He knows what I'm talking about. Today, if you go to Karura, the sports grounds you play on, they became public because of Polika Pigate. Because of them, we have And we redonated it back uh, to the city of Nairobi. Now, but I'm trying to show you how extractive even large corporates can be. Why would you accept to be given 30 acres of land <laughs> just for 200 people to play in when Nairobi is so short of green spaces? So that's why I'm inviting the charitable nature, the social investment of private sector to come. You now have me in Nairobi. I will not be accountable for the Nairobi Foundation. The Nairobi Foundation will be managed by the Nairobi Economic Social Council, which will be formed. And they will sit there and manage the Nairobi Foundation and make sure all charities in the world. I was so surprised how many people are looking to bring money here, but they have no honest, sincere person to give. Around the world, the Vitol Foundation, Vitol is, one of, is the largest company in the world that and I know these people. I'm on first name basis with their CEOs and their chairmen. I walk to London and I don't need an appointment. I can meet them. I walk to Hong Kong. I meet the chairman of the Hang HSBC Foundation. The chair, I go to Shanghai. I meet them. They tell me, what can we do in Nairobi? And I say, it is because we have low bandwidth politicians. Now you understand, I'm not attacking anyone. 
Low bandwidth is a very dangerous thing. Mr. Lungao, my primary school headmaster, used to say, little knowledge is very dangerous, Igathe. And we have allowed people of little knowledge to occupy positions of high responsibility in politics. And that's why we have failed. That's why my subject today is who? I was on the scorecard. Society, zero hunger, decent job, well-being. What are we going to do with decent jobs? Ladies and gentlemen, I appeal to you, your private sector lands. Let me use the plight of a watchman. A friend of mine called Makoha, he's a guard in a company in the industrial area. I'll not mention the company. Then there's a minimum wage stipulation in this country. It says, pay your people this amount of money. And this year, the president pronounced himself on the minimum wage. I can tell you in the security sector, which employs a lot of people from the Kisi community and the Luya community, majority of them are not being paid a living wage. We have far too many large corporates that are not paying people a living wage. You're paying people below. And you know, you're cutting your own legs because when you pay people a living wage, a decent wage, what do you do? You add your aggregate demand. Your order books automatically go up. If you pay somebody a salary below the minimum wage, what are we saying? We shall incentivize you to pay a minimum wage. I still remember Mohammed Mukras. You don't force people, you don't penalize people, you use economic incentives to get people to do the right thing. When I lived in Australia, when you drove on a highway and you were over speeding, you saw a sign saying, hey, speed gun in 100 kilometers. That time I'm driving at 150. So what is the <laughs> sign telling me? Come back to the right speed. We don't want to arrest you. That is how we shall run government. We want to, it's an incentive for me to obey the law. We are going to give large businesses and medium-sized businesses and small businesses and micro businesses an incentive to obey the law. How are we going to do it? I shall give an aggressive discount on the single business permit and on land rates for all companies that, and we will use e-government that pay minimum wage. But we shall also enforce minimum wage through the single business permit. We shall enforce the minimum wage through the single business permit. We can't have somebody who wakes up every morning from Kibra to go to industrial area, comes back poorer than the way they went. That's how there's a lot of anger in the city of Nairobi. I uh, wish to apply that. Let's also capture, find me new incentives to encourage people to pay the minimum wage. What am I saying? Decent jobs. But we shall also protect the large businesses. They'll not be harassed. They'll be given time to make sure that they ramp up. We are not coming to harass anybody. So there'll be decent jobs. Zero hunger, decent job. And what is well-being? You've spoken to it. Nairobi is the smallest high-density city. Nairobi has 696 square kilometers. The city county of Nairobi, by the way, owns 532 hectares of land. City county of Nairobi. I'll come to land use. I'm talking about society. For well-being, we shall repair every single school sports ground and ensure that sports ground is then used by the local community over the weekend. We shall bring it to superb standards. <laughs> Secure it and bring it to superb standards. Those are enough grounds. And you can count the number of schools. At least in Nairobi, I know they're in excess of 250 schools. And while I'm at it, I'm going to leave at more than 1,000 primary schools. We don't have enough. We don't have enough early childhood education schools. And I'm also going to construct technical, vocational, educational training institutes. Three in every constituency. Three times 17, Hesabu Raisi, 51. Tibets. And while at it, start by employing 100 kids who will go to the existing Tibets for training in every ward, so create jobs for 8,500 automatically who will, will give an apprenticeship in the county. I want Kepsa to join me because I want these kids to also come for apprenticeship in your company. Then you hand them back to us. They go through 12 months and they become the future of Nairobi City County. The average age of a worker in Nairobi City County is 52. In a city where the average age is 19. Ladies and gentlemen, you can improve my scorecard, but I've given you my vision. Judge me on whether ni Mr. Wisha Jami on three things. Zero hunger for anybody living in the city, decent jobs, and well-being. 
and well-being is about sports, culture, green spaces, and those things I've spoken about. I don't want to repeat your presentation, Carl. That's why I'm asking for a scorecard. The, third, the second thing I will do is around the economy, which I think is very close. And with the economy, we are saying to Taboresha Uchumi, how are you going to do it? Three, my scorecard has three things, Carol. The number one is brand the city. If you go to Cape Town, Cape Town attracts over, I don't know, 10 million visitors. And all they have is wine fields and a gray stone called the Table Mountain. Then they've created a lift to go up the Table Mountain. People come to see it. We have underutilized our assets. The Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, a hub. The central business district of Nairobi, amazing asset. Karura, Ngong, Uhuru Park, our weather. In fact, you put it very well. Our weather is the biggest asset, sun all round. Our geolocation, we are the eye of Africa. In fact, if you draw the map of Africa and you put an eye, you're right on Nairobi, right? We are every global city in the world. Breakfast here, dinner in London. Breakfast here, dinner in Buenos Aires. Breakfast here, dinner in uh, New Delhi. My friends, are you going to entrust this city on, a, on what kind of fellows will you entrust a city that queens and lords over a population of 300 million people? Because Nairobi is the hub, heartbeat of Kenya, front porch of East Africa, nation centerpiece. Who will you entrust it on is the question on the ballot. The question on the ballot is not Igadia Sakaja. Is Nani Mtapatia Kazi to become the most important CEO of which city? Let me tell you, we headquarter Somali, we headquarter Somaliland, we headquarter Ethiopia, we headquarter Djibouti, we headquarter, I have said Ethiopia already, South Sudan, Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, the whole lakeside, they come to hospital here. Their children come to school here. They come shopping here. When they have a weekend, they come dancing here. They come dating here. They come for honeymoon here. And the uniqueness of Nairobi, the only city of 6 million people, 600 kilometers from the sea. The management of, sea, of the Nairobi, Casablanca, Cape Town, Buenos Aires, all, everybody in the world lives at sea level near the water. Nairobi is the only city, one of the few cities that is inland. And when Uhuru Kenyatta and his government de bottlenecks logistics with the standard gauge railway, we say it's expensive. Because we don't understand the big picture. We don't see. We don't see. We have no epiphany. Because if you have 300 million people and you are the lord of it, you bring the logistics center, you share the logistics center, you just have a port in Mombasa and you start to move inland. That's why Embakasi today, near the airport, Embakasi South, has become the largest logistic center. Start, we are now six hours from the beach, thank God, to the work that was done with the Standard Gauge Railway. That railway levy we paid has enabled Nairobi, promise, a visitor to be six hours in the beach. Lee Kuan Yew, how did he define Nairobi? Singapore, which is perhaps my favorite city of all places. He said if you're traveling in an economy class ticket of an airplane and you land at the airport in Singapore, the last person off the plane going to the farthest hotel in the city should take 20 minutes. That is a scorecard he gave the city managers. That was his definition. And then he asked, who sits between our goal of 20 minutes from the time the plane lands to the time you get to your hotel? That was the standard. That's what I mean by scorecards. How do we hold politicians accountable? Zero. I have never seen a country where people earn a salary for doing nothing more than Kenya. That's why I resigned the time before. I will never take a salary for doing nothing. I promise you Nairobians, I promise you Kenyans, I promise you Kepsa here today from my heart. I will not take a salary for nothing. I worked in equity. I built the biggest balance sheet during COVID-19. I found a 600 bill, 500 billion balance sheet. I left equity with 1.2 trillion balance sheet. I found Shell had left Western Kenya. It had only 98 petrol stations. I left 202 petrol stations. I found Hako, a small company, employing 400 people. I left close to 1,200 employees, and we sold that company to a global conglomerate. I am a performer who behaves. I'm somebody who performs and behaves. I submit to you, I'm the man you need. I'm the man you want. 
but the choice is yours on 9th of August. And I'm giving you my scorecard. So on the economy is brand the city. On the economy is catalyze Biashara. The single business permit is truly going to become a single business permit. I'm going to aggregate the revenue lines from 126 to no more than a dozen. And one, we then we'll segment the business permit. Can you imagine a hotel and restaurant, how many permits? How much permits Kempinski requires? Food handlers, fire, single business permit. Why do you call it single business permit? Then you create another 44. Why can't it just be truly single business permit? And it should be a QR code. There's nobody who enters your premises. The QR code is at the road. It just does like that. Confirms that whether it's paid or not. We shall catalyze Biashara, but the biggest promise under catalyzing Biashara is a single business permit. But the most important one under Uchumi, and allow me to get stuck here, is to truly take Nairobi out of the jaws of capture by cartels and organized criminals. Nairobi is a big organized criminal field and cartel. What am I talking about? Guys, that's the real, that's the real question. I said my favorite chapter in the Constitution is chapter one. Let me add another chapter. My favorite chapter is also chapter four of the Constitution. Chapter four is the Bill of Rights. Chapter one is about sovereignty of the people. Chapter four is the Bill of Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proposing something <coughs> ballistic. I'm asking that we activate chapter four of Kenya's Constitution in Nairobi, part four especially. Declare corruption a state of emergency. What does the law say? The Constitution allows the president of the country, together with the governor, to speak and declare a state of Don't, Let's not take, declare the state of emergency in Kenya. Let's call the state of emergency on corruption in the city county of Nairobi. The life of the Kenyan nation is today threatened, not by war, not by invasion, not by general insurrection, not by natural disaster, but by corruption in Nairobi. Corruption in Nairobi is threatening the Republic of Kenya. And if you bring somebody of questionable documents, somebody of ineligible capability, a party that is an aggregation and conglomeration of cartoons, charlatans, thieves, drug addicts, corrupt people, do not blame anyone else. I am asking and I'm pronouncing in my manifesto to parliament because I'm a mere governor. The people of Kenya, because the National Assembly and the government, and who Raila Molo Dinga has pronounced himself on corruption. And that's why I love Mother Karoa, Wangari Karoa, an icon woman on fighting corruption. And she has a partner called Mother Kome, who we are going to work with. Together with Polika Vigade and Professor Kaloki, we have no, I want you to support that we declare a state of emergency on corruption. Enact a law conferring extraordinary powers to make regulations that give extraordinary power to the governor and to the president to tackle this corruption issue. By the way, it's in the Constitution. If you doubt it, read Article 132, Subsection 4, Part D of Chapter 4 of Kenya's Constitution. And I'm not a lawyer. This is the laws. The problem in Kenya is not new laws. It's enforcing the laws we have. In Constitution allows the president to declare a state of emergency on a particular issue. We must do it in Nairobi. But let's not do it and look like we are coming to create a firing squad to kill people. I'm also asking that in addition to declaring the state of emergency, in equal measure I'll be inviting the Nairobi County Assembly and the National Assembly to pronounce themselves on an amnesty before we activate the state of emergency. We create an amnesty that allows restitution, recovery, and regularization. Do you know nine out of 10 buildings you see in Eastlands does not have a building permit? We don't even have a map. People build like this, then they go like this. There is no lighting. That's why rickets, the biggest prevalence of rickets is in the city county of Nairobi, which is on the equator. Lack of vitamin D is one of the biggest public health issues in the city county of Nairobi. Lack of vitamin D. People just build. You build. So you hear people talking and you say, why? But it's impunity. But what can we do as governor? Do I come and destroy all of them? Break those buildings? Let's create a room and a road to recovery and regularization. There are so many of us, including some of us in this room, and I'm sorry to say including myself, 
who have grabbed school land, especially churches. And you know, those guys are really hurting us because they've become a transmission mechanism for corruption. That's what the church has become. They have no moral authority. They have become a transmission mechanism. We are stealing school land. You go to city primary, look. Go to go look. The headmasters of primary school are using school fields as parking lots and charging for parking. We are stealing health center. We are stealing sports ground. You know how the Muzungu had designed Nairobi? Every ward in Nairobi had a school sports ground, had a social hall, had a health center, had a Early, a primary, um, an early childhood education uh, school. It had a fire station. It had every ward had that. Today, if you go there, where I live in Karura Ward, on the left, was a fire station, right opposite KGTC, which was grabbed. But the person who grabbed it lives and plays golf in this city. Now, Duego, and the institution that should have stopped him exist. Do I go and kill the institution? Ladies and gentlemen, if we can give an amnesty on tax, we can also give an amnesty on corruption. But even in my church, and I'm Catholic by faith, we go and say confession. I confess, yeah? Yeah? like this, but we atone for our sins. Atonement is restitution, is recovery, is regularization. But it requires the best lawyers who are not founded in the technicality of the law, but in the spirit and letter of the law. I think one of the biggest challenges we have in Kenya is because of doing law. They don't start, study liberal arts or other things, so they don't think on first principles. Yeah? And we have too many lawyers, and I have no issue with lawyers. I, I just think as a profession, and even me as a professional, we should not be people who know too little about, too much about too little. We need to really move on and move on, and that's a promise. This corruption thing, if I don't fix it, you can consider what you have presented to me dead on arrival. The reason why this has happened is not because we don't know. The reason why Uhuru Mwivei Kenyatta has become very unpopular in Kikuyu land is because he shut fronted corruption. So all corrupt people and their representative have moved to the yellow party. Actually, this election is not about any other tribe. The Luyas know how they will vote. The Kambas know how they will vote. The Luos know how they'll vote. The Muindis know how they will vote. The politics is done in mother tongue, so don't get panic. The only people who are going to be tested, whether their culture, their beliefs, their character, the people on trial on 9th of August is my tribe, the Mogekoyos. It is a referendum on whether you Kikuyus truly believe in your own stomachs and ideas or whether you believe in the nationalist covenant that is Kenya. We are where our grandfathers were. Those who were led by Dedan Kimathi and Bildad Kagia from Kiburi House on Grogan Road to go and fight for independence and the land army. And those who fought with the challenge is different. It's not a challenge of land. It's not a challenge of hardware. It's a challenge of software. Watch the software of the leader you elect on 9th of August, ladies and gentlemen. It is about who. I am making a promise to tackle city capture by cartels in my scorecard. So my three, my three goals under Uchumi is brand the city, catalyze Biashara, and tackle city capture. And I know they start, Jaindi Kisero wrote a beautiful article that corruption starts with budgeting. I want to go further and say corruption starts with elections. You accept money from the devil, you go to the office with your hands tied. You accept money to be fundraised, by the wrong people, so please make sure that elections fundraising, which is part of political parties bill, is a very important chapter of our society. There are very many politicians today accepting checks from the wrong people. I want to finish. Let me finish. I think I've spoken too long. Let me finish. The last thing is about the environment. Kuboresha Mazingirayet. We are... Nairobi has 500 land use. How do you have a city county with 532 hectares of land? And on that land sits 12,000 single dwelling units. 12,000 12, single dwelling units sit on 500 acres of land. By the way, if you're doubting me, go and drive from city stadium to Dunholm. That's the land I'm talking about. 
poor land use. We have and zoning and urban planning. Land use and urban planning is a, is a commitment. Safety and security, pollution of air, noise, and water. And bring, making the city climate smart, the challenge of our times, ladies and gentlemen, is poverty, disease, ignorance, and climate change in the city of Nairobi. And if that challenge is not won in Nairobi, that challenge will be won or lost in Nairobi for the rest of Kenya. And that's why I have put my candidature up. I'm, I'm, I'm my candidature with Professor Kaloki, my candidate as Azimio Laumoja, is to become the champion of public need and the reduce, expand public need, reduce and eliminate, eliminate to the extent possible private greed. Public need versus private need. Ladies and gentlemen, I may have disappointed you by talking too long by talking too passionately. But you are the power. You are sovereign power. You are chapter one of Kenya's constitution. And even the lawyers went further and they were very prescriptive. They gave you chapter six, which you ignore, which institutions ignore. When institutions ignore chapter six, it's your job, you're the last line of defense at the election to do the right thing. And presented to you, and I have even gone to the community that matters the most. The swing vote in this country is Mount Kenya. That's where everybody is living there. That's where the swing But when I say Mogekoyos, I know what I'm talking about. And politics is the tyranny of numbers, whichever way you compute them. There are million Kikuyus in Nairobi. You are the ones who will decide. How Nairobi looks, the governor of Nairobi will reflect who Kikuyus are. Who Kikuyus are. The rest of Kenya will know. And Kenya is not a tennis match between the Kalenjins and the Kikuyus for presidency. It is not. And there is a mammalian politician and a reptilian politician. Those are the people on the ballot on 20. You know how reptiles behave? They lay eggs, they sting, they are like, they run away. They don't even take care of their children. But mammals nurture. They are like Raila Odinga, you know? You nurture. You try. Very five years, the man is still, he's like an elephant. He's a mammal, graceful, kind, proper. Even when you disagree with him, he says, well, come. His best friend, Miguna Miguna, writes the most rudest of books. The guy still sits with him. You know, he disagrees. Which part of this can you see, especially you, Kikuyus? Which part of it can you see? It is time to unite the country, ladies and gentlemen, as I close. And we unite the country in hardware terms and in software terms. We are now united by road networks. We are united by electricity. We are united by access to data. In fact, there is no longer rural urban in Kenya. If you see a young woman dressed in Pasenga in Nyandarwa and one dressed in Westlands, Nairobi, they dress the same. They have the same access to information because the information superhighway has connected them. But the hardware is different. The software is different. This thing called corruption has eaten us to the bone. It is time to say a stop. If you believe corruption must stop, then you will vote Igathe, you will vote Raila Molo Dinga, you will vote Mother Karua, you will vote uh, Lord, uh, Edwin Sifuna, you will vote Esther Pasaris in Nairobi, and lastly, you will vote an MCA with a name in the Azimio coalition. <laughs> that is what you will do. If you love corruption, then uh, let, and on the 10th of August, let us, the majority, have their way, and the minority will have had their. If you did not like anything I said, I sincerely apologize. I did not mean to hurt you. I just meant to speak truth to power. And I am the fellow applying for a job to be governor of Nairobi City County. I'm competent, I'm capable, I'm confident, and I'm humble enough to be your servant. I'm, I am coming to be your servant. Go and look for votes for me if you are convinced. Go and tell your brother and your sister that this is the election of a lifetime. This is the time we truly show Wajibu Wango. This is the time we truly do that. Because the conversation in Kenya is not about what needs to be done, or how it needs to be done, or why it needs to be done. The conversation is about who will do it. Who will do it? And this conversation, the people who have not decided the most, they are around Mount Kenya. And those are the ones. 
because all parties have come together. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. Vote for us because we shall change society, change the economy for the better, change the environment for the better. We shall make everybody see. We shall have a beautiful, wonderful city. If you forget everything I've said, just remember, vote for me, and your property will increase in value 10 times. Thank you for listening to me. Well, thank you very much, our key guest, Mr. Igade. The team in the room. Mumesikia maneno? Kawaidetu ni kuleta kila mtu aonge kisha tare sita mwezi wa nane. Mnajua kitu mnafaa mfanye, sindio? Mnafaa ni tare tisa mwezi wa nane. Nilisema? Sita. Oh, sita. Oh, sindia lituko juu na sante. And what we've gotten from the two sessions, if you remember, and because we had had dinner with Her Excellency Salif Johnson, the message that is coming out from the two presentations, because it is about economic manifesto, it says, she guided and she told us that we are here because we share fundamental belief that poverty, illiteracy, disease, and inequality do not belong in the 21st century. We share a common purpose to eradicate these ills for the benefit of all. Isn't that the message that the private sector is saying and also public have said? Is that the message? So to us, to everyone, we say thank you. You have had the information. And as usual, as in Kenya, Daima, you're told, kagua kabla kuchagua, msikize kila mtu, mpige kura, na mdumishe amani. Na kwa vile, pia sisi ni wa Kenya, na tunakumbuka jinsi tunapenda kupiga makofi, na pia kuna wimbo ambao tukwa nae na itua tushangilie Kenya, ambao tutaimba badae, na chaka tupige makofi kwa lugha ya kiswahili. Na kwa kiswahili tutapiga moja, mbili, tatu, nune, Na wale ambao nakumbuka jinsi tukua tunapiga makofi wakati wa enzi zile, tutafani hivu leo. Na kwa kawaida hatutafunga kwa vile bado tunendele na mkataba wetu. Na badai ni tamuita mhandisi mku, anitua James Mwangi, atakuja kutendeleza na maswali. Na wanda ingino wanafani hivi. Eh? Some of you are shaking, right? Okay, let me switch back to English.
know what you are going to do, either the county will come up with the breakdowns that you can know this belong to the county government or NMS, or we allow the same crook people to continue taking and stealing from good Nairobi people. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Now let's cut it off there. We'll have a second round. Uh, so, Polycap, I think uh, it may be good for you to take those first five. Thank you very much. Wangi, and thank you very much for the questions. I'll also be very quick. Wamboi Barire, I think you do a very good job with the retail sector. Um, I'm very proud of supermarkets. I earned a lot of bonuses from supermarkets buying goods and the retail sector buying goods from me. Now, this 25 lies, you, your question is about sustainability. I completely agree. You know, in, in Swahili there is a saying, Mgala muwe lakini haki yake mpe. If there is somebody who brought a good system for licensing, it was Governor Kidero. You, we've got to give it to Governor Kidero. Governor Kidero contributed, and he even brought a lot of technology behind it. But the sustainability of it for them. But it's because of exactly what I said. If you are monitor, the only sustainability to any system is because there is a scorecard that is relevant to the people and a performance agreement that is relevant to the people. Just like in business, a scorecard relevant to customers, a performance agreement relevant to customers. I come back. And that is what I'm bringing to Nairobi City County. I'm going to form what is the Nairobi City County Corporate Services. It will include legal, HR, finance, the corporate body. Then there'll be Nairobi Health Services, Nairobi Environmental Services, Nairobi, the, the executing agencies. So we are going to reform, retool, rejig, and create a fit for purpose organization for service delivery, essential service delivery. And that is what we'll do. I'm not going to recreate anything. I will take the best that has been done in the past and lift it and make it sustainable. I am not the type who comes and rubbishes everybody who came in front of me. I pick up from where, I take their successes, and I fix their failures, and I move on. That's my philosophy. Uh, and that is what we shall do. But single business permit will mean exactly that. Well, supermarkets will only have one, even if there are multiplicity there. And then we'll also say, here is your annual single business permit rate. You can pay it daily, hourly, monthly, will give you options of paying it uh, in terms of also paying, especially for the micro small entrepreneur because you can only pay uh, as you go. Um, but we will also really fix the revenue system because Nairobi, you can't believe we have almost 2.9 discrete properties in Nairobi. Do you know how many properties pay rates? But they don't pay rates because they don't get services and they're not regularized. Only 120,000 properties pay rates in Nairobi. It's like a family of three million people, but it's only 120,000 who bring food home for people to eat. Too few people carrying uh, too many people. That's my answer to, to your question, and I welcome any other ideas you have, because we are going to run Nairobi with public participation. We'll activate the Neighborhood Act. I'll give you an example. My dream is that there is not a single invoice that we do three-way matching or LPU of Nairobi City County that will be signed off unless the residents association signs and says the portal was fixed, the storm drain was covered, the estate association or you business association, that is how we shall do it. We shall get you involved uh, part and parcel. Muzai, I think the other question is from Winnie, MCAs and their interest. What is really eating the MCAs? Because the Nairobi County Assembly has become the Nairobi County Executive. There is going to be a Chinese war. Parliament oversight. Executive executes. Parliament oversight, executive executes. And if you look, Nairobi has 42 MCAs who are Kikuyus. The 43s are others in 2013. 45 are Kikuyus last time when I ran. 40 are others, other tribes. You know, I have beef. I don't have beef with the Kikuyus. I'm a Kikuyu myself. I just want Kikuyus to really take themselves to what we call a Mushemanio, a meeting. <laughs> Nairobi has 45 MCAs. I can tell you, because I like to speak mother tongue, because this is politics. These 45 Kikuyu MCAs are controlled by three Somalis. That's a fact. There is a cabal. The capture is too serious. Even yesterday, they were doing things that are completely illegal and illicit. As late as of, of, of yesterday. 
Now you wonder, my tribesmen, this money, what are we going to do with it? We, the political culture of the Kikuyu used to be lion-hearted. It has now become vulturistic and hyenaistic. The lion only eats the animal. It's a predator. But we, we are killing one another. We are caring at one another. We have a few people who have become way too greedy. If you look, go to the county now, the invoices being paid are being paid to few people of one community. Salaries are not even being paid. The Nairobi city worker is the most demotivated. Let me tell you, in answering your MCA question, I am taking over a county with debts of 85 billion shillings. When Sonko and I took over, we had 58 billion debt. I don't know how it has hit 85 billion. We don't have a fixed asset register. Nairobi City is not a going concern. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot give this job to somebody without the competence to get it done. I will deal with MCS politically. I told you the political parties are the shareholders of politics. That was a loaded statement. The most disciplined political leader in Kenya who has an organic following, a relationship politics, Israel Amolo Dinga. All the rest, I can argue, have a transaction of following. People follow you because you pay them money. You mobilize. Eh? Only Raila Molo Dinga has discipline. When he says this goes in ODM, it goes. Kalonzo, when he says this goes in Wipa, it goes. Uh, uh, Wamalwa says this goes in DAP, it goes. Um, uh, Upia uh, says this goes, it goes. Wipa says this goes, it goes. But Jubilee, Uhuru says this goes. Fight starts tomorrow. What's wrong with you, Kikuyus? And on 10th of August, the lawyers will go to their party. The lawyers will go to their party because that's how we have organized ourselves and there's nothing wrong. Eh? The campers will go to their party. Kikuyus, where will you go? We must aggregate. Politically, we must organize ourselves. And that's where we shall, control, we, that's where we shall manage the MCs, through political party. And that's why Azimio Laumoja is the wipe away, the NAC Kenya way, the, TNA, uh, the Jubilee way, the ODM way, the UPIA way, the DAP way, as in me or Moja. It's like this ball, dynamic, moving. And that's why Kenyans must elect that unity, that political unity. If we don't answer the political question, we will forever be in debates about the economic and social question. And we have political party organization. As in me or Moja is the best thing after sliced bread. Sanitation and informal settlements in Nairobi. We are going to bring a system and get inspired by the Japanese called Jokasu. Jokasu is where your waste soil, night, night soil treatment is done. And we shall do it under the Nairobi Foundation, especially in informal settlements. You've asked a powerful question. Many people don't know that five out of 10 Nairobians still go to toilet on the long drop. Even people in Runda, Spring Valley, and Karen, they have sophisticated long drops because that is what a septic tank is. People don't flush toilets. If you don't allow a citizen to go to the toilet with dignity, what are you doing? Chris Kirubi taught me one thing I'll never forget. If you go to an organization or a company or a hotel, first of all, go to the toilet the workers go to. If it's dirty, you don't need to be told the quality of that MD. I call it the toilet test. I used to use it in, even in Shell. If you go to a dirty toilet, that's why I was cleaning toilets. Also, in addition to tell the cartels, we can take shit and we can deal with it, you know? Many of them thought it was a joke. We can clean it up. And I'm not afraid to do so. Because I'm a Kenyan and I don't see anyone else. It's my responsibility to clean after myself rather than expect another uh, other person to do. The MCA, so what am I saying? Vote for the entire MCA and Azimio and we shall. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm running late because I'm going for a meeting with MCAs. And you know they're my bosses too. Um, they will be my bosses from an oversight point of view, but we shall work we are going to be unified. We shall work with the whips. There is a whip. There is a majority leader. I don't know whether you see it in America. Even when they walk, there is statecraft. The president, the speaker, the leader of the majority. That is the political order. It's like a company. There is a chairman, there is a CEO, and there is management. That protocol and statecraft has been lost somewhere in the middle. You find a fellow who has nothing to do challenging the party leader. What business do you have challenging Raila Molo Odinga? Of course we have organizations, we have the delegates conference, we have these other ones, but this political indiscipline and it is fired up and financed by corruption. That's why corruption in Nairobi must be declared a state of emergency. 
the third thing, uh, sanitation, I've told you, sanitation and settlement, that one we are going to work on. And by the way, the French government has been very kind and there's a lot of um, connection, trunking that is going on on, on on sewer. At the end of my term, all neighborhoods in Nairobi will be connected to the public sewer system. And we shall recover land stolen and protect the land. The lowest part in Nairobi is Roy. That's why the solid waste flows there. But you know all that land had been stolen and people are growing trees there and doing farming. You know, that's why Nairobi cannot be given to a farmer. This in Shambhala Mawe. You know? The third thing, the fourth thing, Degwa, lovely to see you. Youth buying. You know, Degwa, let me tell you, youth is very trans. Uh, it's Gatia, 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 Muhoya. You know, this country, the average age is 19. In fact, the biggest mistake we make is to create a ministry of youth. Because the country is young. But young people are adults. Stop begging. Change your clothes. Come and run for political office. I'm very happy to see very many young people running for political office. Occupy. In fact, one of my competitors for the seat of governor is 25. I'm really excited to see him put up his hand. The buying, nobody will ever, you will not, you are not a special interest group. The special interest group in, in, the, in, in the economy is PWDs and women. Women, we have, those are special interest groups. The youth, you are the population. You are the population. Uh, the youth, you are the population. And the buying will come Young people, you've been always, you are the most powerful people. You're the most powerful people, so we really need, but the buy-in is by making sure we have more young people in decent jobs. And you heard what I'm going to do with the single business, incentivizing businesses to make sure minimum wages are there too. Um, then there is a Peter on harassment. Peter, I completely agree with you. We have to relaunch the Nairobi City County Inspectorate Department. Relaunch it. Completely relaunch it. New uniform, new hardware, new software. It's just a simple thing. And also get rid of colonialistic, extractive laws and regulation. Because if you ask an Nairobi City County Askari, he'll give you a law he's working to. But those laws were created to prevent these MQQs, who I'm inspiring, to come to the city to work. That's why you had to paint your door. To paint your door, change your door knob, you need to ask the guy in City Hall. That's a colonial law. It's to make sure that they know where you are and where you have come from. But because it started to serve the interests of the Askari, because he can threaten you with it and make some money, it's remained there. We are going to get rid of colonialistic, exact, extractive laws. That's why one of the most important, one of the most important jobs in my government will be the Attorney General of Nairobi City County. Has to be a Top-notch, smart person, not somebody who just tells me, I contributed to your campaign, therefore give me a cabinet seat. You know, that's how they do it. Yeah? It has to be top-notch uh, person. And, and uh, to, uh, together, so we will relaunch the Nairobi City County Inspectorate. Um, I think I've answered all the questions that you've uh, put before me, and I really thank you for, for, uh, for the questions. I can, if you want me to take another round, I will. Thank you. All right, I know we are running uh, short of time, and... Uh, like Polycap says, he has his bosses um, uh, who, who also want to hear from him. Uh, we have our chair. Uh, we have the lady at the back. We have this gentleman. And we have that. Please allow us to cut it there because I also have additional online questions. So Polycap, um, the last round uh, of questions. Again, no paper. Uh, just ask the questions. Let's let's start with you. You had the mic. Uh, your name, please. Uh, my name is Behi David from Millennial Speak. Okay. Thank you, incoming governor. We have no doubt that you're the man for the job. So my question is, uh, you've well said that 500,000 out of Nairobi's 5 million population is uh, unemployed, and 70% of them work in the informal sector. Sector for those who work. So what's your plan, not only to create or formalize this sector, but also provide linkages to the global economy? Because that's where we're heading. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we'll have the lady at the back, and then we'll come to you, gentlemen. Let's have the lady, and then we'll have the gentleman. OK? Again, just a question, please. Your name, please. Thank you. My name is uh, Mary Gesare. I chair Nairobi Regional 
income sector. My question to my incoming uh, governor is, you've told us you are celebrating your 50 years in September, very good. Our sewer line is as old as uh, your age. It has never been improved. I don't know what plans you have for Nairobi to uh, develop the sewer line. And uh, on the North Airport Road, there's no sewer line. Thank you very much. Okay, I, 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 I did recall some mention about a uh, trunking system that he wants to do. In fact, I think, if I'm not wrong, he has promised by the end of his tenure, the whole of Nairobi will have a sewer system, but again, he can reconfirm it. So thank you very much, uh, Madam. And uh, the gentleman in front there, before we come to the chair of uh, CAPSA. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Polycap. My name is Jimmy Kiberu. And uh, thank you so much for a very, very powerful presentation. My question is on zoning. I got excited when you said that our properties are going to grow in value almost 10 times. But anyway, the question is, um, what are you going to do concretely to rezone Nairobi? This morning as I was coming, I saw Gertrude's Hospital, for example. A few meters down the road, you had a tall, towering apartment complex. I think it's built by Chinese. And it's about 45 floors. And that's a general trend all around those areas of uh, Lovington, Valley Arcade, and all areas. I mean, it's really terrible. Night clubs have invaded residential areas. I just want you to speak to yourself about concretely what you would do about zoning. Okay, thank you very much. And then let's have the chair of uh, CAPSA. Um, Pretty similar to that. Um, it's around the neighborhood associations. You know, they, 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 there is always this thing we want to have. Um, they have to be participants, they have to agree to what is happening. But even if the neighborhood association says no, we see the developments going up. So they've been requesting for MOUs that are recognized in law and um, just to find a way around the town planning. Thank you very much. And then allow me to pull up uh, just three more here from the online so that we don't seem uh, like we're discriminating them. This is from your good friend Bill Lay. How will Polycarp utilize NMS and Namata? Okay, so I think that will be a straightforward answer. Then uh, also from somebody who I believe you have served uh, in Kepsa with, Lucy Karume. Karume. Do you have a plan to partner with neighboring counties in your zoning manifesto? And I think that is also uh, pertinent. And then the last question uh, from uh, Mr. Karanja Njoroke. What options will you support for people mobility in Nairobi? It may have been captured a little bit under chaps and what have you. So, ladies and gentlemen, allow us to stop there and give uh, Polycap a chance to answer those before we bring uh, this session to a close. Welcome. Wow, amazing questions. Clearly, Nairobi to Navio Itaka. Um, let me start with NMS um, uh, from, from Billy. He'll be happy that I answered him first, <laughs> and because he's a really good friend of mine. Um, we are definitely, I am a great celebrator of NMS. NMS stood in to fill the gap. Um, Nairobi was being disbanded as a county, and it, if it was not for the benevolence of Uhuru Mwigai Kenyatta, even the MCAs you asked about would not exist. NMS is the bridge between Nairobi County, which was extinguishing, and Nairobi County which we are taking over. And they have done a hard job under difficult circumstances, and I celebrate General Buddy and the work that he has done. Um, well, the Nairobi Metropolitan NMS is not, was, was a creature of the law, and it will be extinguished by the law. And the extinguishing is happening, I think, around November, if I'm right. So as we take over office on the 10th of August, because you look really convinced that you want sincere, honest people to serve you, we, we will take over the instruments of power. Our assumption of office will be both from the governor, High Excellency Governor Kananu, and also from general body. And it's a creature of the law. There's really no contest about it. Uh, the law will take its cause, and even if I'm governor, I'm a human being, I'm subordinate to the law, and that is what will happen. And thank, thank God for NMS. NMS, by the way, just so that you don't think I'm a man of platitudes, dug 140 boreholes in informal settlements during COVID-19. That is how a massive disaster would have occurred. Because Nairobi consumes a million liters of cubic liters of water, Nairobi only 
has capacity to supply 500,000 cubic liters of water. When I leave Governor Nairobi in five years, the supply-demand equation will be equalized. The supply of water will exceed demand. Under my, what Uhuru has done to electricity in Kenya, I will do to water in Nairobi. I will leave excess water supply to the city county, working with Raila Molo Odinga and Mother Karua, who's the champion of water reforms in the Republic of Kenya. Many people do not know that. So uh, let me put that. Gesare, really, I think your question on sewer lines, I, I absolutely answered. There's a lot of sewer works going on. The biggest fight you saw in the national government, and actually what separated, I think, uh, Jubilee was a piece of land in Roy, which was grabbed, that belonged to sewer treatment works. So sewer lines are being done, work is being done. I promise you, Gesare, judge me when I leave office in five years. Nairobi will all be sewered, 100%. That's my promise. If you notice, I'm running away from 100 days promises. The only 100 day promise I'm making to Nairobians is I will motivate and create a fit for purpose organization for essential service delivery because it does not exist. Workers are not paid, I'll start paying them. They don't have job description, they will get. They will get a scorecard and they'll get a performance agreement from me. I'm going to clean the offices and remove stoves from the offices. And that area around City Hall will start to look like a place of a functional office to serve the people of Kenya. Not a place to just uh, do, do what they want. And um, our Nairobi City workers have been forgotten for far too long. I will pay attention to them. My first attention in the first 100 days is to construct a solid cabinet, a solid executive, and really motivate and get to understand so that in 100 days I'll be ready to serve and also take over from NMA. That's my 100-day promise, um, really, because I have to start from there. Uh, 45 floors, we must densify Nairobi strategically. I've told you, we, our land use is very poor. We, are, we must densify sustainably and strategically, and urban renewal must happen. But Nairobi will be the capital city of clubbing, entertainment, and concerts. There's nothing wrong with drinking and dancing. There's nothing wrong. The old profession exists in every city and we shall continue. If you go to New York, we all go to party on Times Square. Yeah? Yes. If you go to Hong Kong, Westlands, Electric Avenue, I will be lit, it will look like Times Square. Koinange Street, we'll, you'll all assemble there for theater, plays. Our Broadway will be Koinange Street. There's a, it's already started. There's a Lyon's Fonse, there's a lot of theater. You'll come and watch plays and then go for dinner. I'm going to remark CBD. Central Business District will be remarked. Westlands will be part of CBD. And CBD will be pedestrianized. My hope is in five years by the time I leave office, there'll be a pavement building revolution in the city of Nairobi to pedestrianize. You leave Donholm and come to Nairobi City County walking with your shoes. Because Donholm is not too far. You leave Runda and come to CBD walking. By remarking CBD, I'm hoping I'll convince the member county assembly that in CBD buildings, first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth floor and fifth floor will be retail centers. Markets, barber shops, salons, bars, shops, and then upstairs people can live, they can become apartments. The richest people in the world live in CBD. I want you, to, the older people, to come and live in CBD and enjoy the energy of the young people because it's safe for them. And hospitals are there. We want people to leave the suburbs and come and club in CBD. What a shame that today CBD, the highest investment per square of meter in Kenya, only works between 9 and 5 p.m. We are crazy. We all assemble all into CBD, we 8 million of us by lunchtime, then we start running away. While in the evening what should be taken on is hawkers, people selling, it should be a bastion, and then delivery and loading zones for supermarkets. We'll create loading zone times. I have to convince the taxi drivers who have taken over parking lots in CBD that we are going to become a pick and drop zone within CBD. Uber drivers, there'll be pick and drop zones. Uh, border border pick and drop zones. So that CBD is just pick and drop but you pedestrianize. We cannot have that the same way my father came to Nairobi with a bus called Geteo, oh, Okayo and Mwenjoyo in 1963. He's dropped in the same place even today. We decant everybody south of Tomboya. If you go to Tomboya, I want to see high rises. My, my relatives, the Rwadia group, 
who come from Onjerere, they came with Kayo and Moenjoyo. Those were the buses. And I want the Nairobi city to face Nairobi River, not to face away from Nairobi River. Michuki Park to be extended. To remove, to start facing the river. That's my promise in five years, that you'll start to see Du Bois Lane, Nyamakema, Grogon, start to go up because they're inspired and because they're creating retail. And you know, if we create those first five floors as market spaces, young people get jobs. Eh? That year? Young people get jobs. That's my buy -in. Women get jobs. Because women, and also make it very safe because it's the most lit. The other thing is you shall light Nairobi. Just lighting. Absolutely lighting. You come to Nairobi, it will shine upon you like Dubai. Shines upon. Because we have no... Can you imagine a country that has excess power that it needs, but the city is dark? How crazy is that? The city is dark, but the country has more power. We are generating more power than we need. Why are we not lighting everywhere? Especially the informal settlements. Mgala Muwe Hakiyake Mpe. The person who brought the plight of the informal settlements to the political scene is one Mike Mbuvi Sonko Kyoko Wakivanguli. That is the man who made us realize politically the problem of the informal settlements. I celebrate him. I celebrate him. And the work that's going on in informal settlements is because he even started his own service. That's how we became friends when I was MD of Shell. I started fueling his trucks to take water there. But now there is water because there are boreholes. Gen um, what am I saying? Life in politics is not politics is not a gladiator sport where you hate the people who came before you. We forgive one another and we move on united and we celebrate the good things people have done. And we forget the bad things they have done. We give them an amnesty. But we move on. The country must heal. Yeah? The country must heal, but the mountain Kenya people must allow Kenya to heal. Then uh, Lucy Karume partner with um, partner with neighboring countries. Lucy Karume, what a beautiful question. That's why I'm reading your because I remember it was a beautiful question. If you give Nairobi Azimio La Umoja, please vote for an Azimio La Umoja governor in Kiambu because we want to connect the railway from Gidurai through Kiambu. Through Tattoo City, which I gave a license when I was chairman of Special Economic Zones Authority, go and check there. I was a chairman. I am the one who gave Tattoo City the license. Yeah, There's another license which was given in Eldoret, but there there's only wheat. Nothing has happened. But Tattoo City, there's work going on. Now you understand why I'm telling you don't vote that side. <laughs> the, 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 I gave Tattoo City the license. If you go, we want to make a railway that will touch Tattoo City, go all the way. To, uh, to Limuru. Then we have a loop line, the great train loop line. We can't do that when I have to go and beg a guy who's into a wheelbarrow. <laughs> I want somebody who's into a dove piece and somebody who's into an orange, COVID-19 disease. An orange is a COVID-19 medicine, vitamin C. <laughs> Kenyans, you have been offered vitamin C and a, and a peaceful dove. And you are choosing an orange and you are choosing a wheelbarrow? You people of Mount Kenya? You want a wheelbarrow, manure, hard work, hard labor. You're ignoring it, you want it, vis-a-vis -vis the other side. That's the question. That's the question on the ballot on the 9th of August. And then, uh, so, Kiambu governor, Azimio, Kajiado governor, Azimio, because we are making a railway line also from Riruta going down to, uh, um, to Kiserian and um, what do you call that town? Ongata Rongai. Give us Machako's governor, Azimio. Give us a Machako's governor, uh, Azimio. That's the metropolitan area. And Lucy Karume, your question is loaded. 10 million out of 50 million Kenyans live there. 20% of our population lives in the metropolitan area. Kibaki had a vision in appointing Ministry of Metropolitan Services. It was that inspiration that enabled us to create the metropolitan service. That's where everybody lives. I've been in fast-moving consumer goods. I've sold every FMCG product on earth. Petrol, beer, soda, wine, cosmetic, rice, chocolates. I've sold everything. And I can tell you, 60% of all fast-moving consumer goods, they go into that area. That's where they are supplied and sold. And that's why that area inspires the rest of the nation. The way we behave in the metropolitan area is the way everybody behaves. And we need trains so that the people of Kiambu can stop bringing red soil into Nairobi. In five years, you will see Nairobi so clean. There'll be no, it will be so clean and shoe shiners. 
we have to make that area look beautiful. And I'm saying that with a light-hearted, on a light-hearted uh, matter. Then uh, the last question is people. The la associations. Neighborhood associations, I'm going to manage with you. I'm speaking to you. Actually, it's not an ask, it's a dictate of the law. We are supposed to activate village councils at ward level. And village councils are allowed by law. But your work is oversight, not executive. Oversight. And our laws are so beautiful. Although I was almost critiquing lawyers sometimes, there are some laws that are beautiful. We, there is an egg principle to governance in Kenya. What I mean by an egg, you have a yolk. That's where the embryo is. That's where the executive. Then the executive is oversighted by the county assembly. That's the egg hoid, right? Then the village councils and neighborhood association, you are the shell. Are we together? And that's why I'm going to create a beautiful shell. And I will want you to nominate the best in Kepsa to come and join me in the Nairobi Economic Social Council. That council is not for politicians. It's for people who are outside of politics in other institutions to help me as a governor because I don't have all the ideas on earth. I am not God, I said. I'm a human being who has come to serve. I need to work with you and go with you. But give me clean people who are honest, not corrupt people who want proximity to power to extract and continue to promote their private greed. I am for public need. If you want somebody to deliver public need, then I'm the man. If you want somebody to deliver private greed, you know who it is. Uh, you know it, the choice is yours. You are the power. You are the power. You are chapter one. You are the sovereign people of the Republic of Kenya. I think I've answered all questions. I really thank you for this engagement. I speak the truth to power mostly and I'm most comfortable at Kepsa because I'm one of you. God bless you for giving us an opportunity, for putting us on the spot on behalf of the people of Kenya to interrogate us. But I'll be amiss if I don't practice in Kenya Daima. Politics is not a gladiator sport. Johnson Sakaja, who is my worthy competitor in the other party, is not my enemy. He's a just a Kenyan who's putting himself up for candidature like I am. When I win on 10th of August, I will work with him. I will consult him because I'm beating him at 8.57 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> I will work with him. He's not my enemy. Let's not fight. Let us continue to listen to one another, continue to campaign in peace, and remember we are one united, indivisible country called Kenya, and respect the nationalist covenants of our founding fathers. Politics is not an enmity. And we should continue to engage the way we are engaging, and I truly respect all of you for listening to me, both the people physically present and the ones online. But if you forget everything I said, you Kikuyus, rescue Kenya <laughs> on 9th of August. Let us have a very, very warm round of applause for Polika Pigade. <laughs> now we are coming to the end uh, of this very, very important event today. Just two messages. On 10th, we have the power, on 10th, to make Nairobi corporate. I think what we hear is that there will be a corporate culture if Polycarp uh, goes in, and that we shall start having terms such as a scorecard and a performance agreement. So there will be a structured method to aim for what needs to be done and ultimately, and ultimately monitor that performance. And then in ending I say this, he has pronounced himself in as far as his performance agreement is concerned based on three things. What were they? What was S? Oh, you're listening. Very good, society. And the next one? E, economy. And the last one? It doesn't get any better than this. Thank you very much. Let me welcome Martha to come and lead us to the final session of our event today. But ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for being extremely active, including those who are online, and for sharing your questions. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, engineer. And because of time, and we always say, when it feels like the end is just often the beginning, 
I would like to request the chair of Kenya Daima to give the vote of thanks. As usual, we have to say Asante. Amanam Nagani. Yes, Mr. Dr. Vimalkis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I know we're short of time, therefore I'll be very, very brief. Um, first and foremost, thank you, Polycarp. Uh, we can say Polly, we can say Polycarp Igathe, we can say Igathe. But I think Polly and your team, the entire team, I think. Oh, what's my alarm? Sorry. Uh, I think we want to say thank you very much to you and your entire team. I think may, may the entire team be recognized if you just stand up. And uh, we recognize you and your whole team. So. If your team just stands up, we just want to say thank you. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much. And thank you for making time for uh, giving us what it is. This is a series that Kepsa runs, and that's what we're looking at, is to say, Kagua Belia Kuchagua, which means let us analyze, let us check whoever's coming on board, and I think that's important. Um, you know, we have this very clear saying, Miminim Kenya Daima, right? Nitatenda wajibuangu. I think that's the key question for every one of us. So I think everybody's going to answer that independently as we go along. And I think that's going to be important as we go further. So I think first and foremost, Wajibuangu, Nikupika Kura. I think that's the message that we want to send to everybody. Just go out there and pick a Kura, number one. Number two, Kuchagua, Biongo Zimbora. Right? We're actually leaving it to all of you. Look at it, Chagua, and then see. Kagua first and say, fine, this is the right team, right people, whatever. And I think it's issue-based. It's all issue-based, and I know it's really good. But again, at the end of it all, Kurubisha Mani. I think you're the muhim. Very, very important for every one of us to say, like you said, Polly, I think whether win or lose, uh, we are all going to be brothers after 10th, and therefore brothers and sisters, sorry, I'd say for, for everyone. And I think you've got to exist together and say, fine, here's what we're going to do. Um, at the end of the day, we're looking for good leadership and accountable governance in place. That's what we're looking for, right? And I think this is for a prosperous and a thriving and peaceful country. So I just want to say thank you very much. And as Kepsa and Mkenya Daima, we continue pushing this. I think the issue is let's all check out what it is. And this forum that, that comes up, I want to thank uh, the Kepsa board, uh, chair, Kepsa board, Kepsa council of advisors, governing council. And also led by um, Chair Flora. I think very well done. Congratulations for leading us into this. The Kepsa Foundation, I think Patrick was here, but he's left. Um, the whole Kepsa Foundation um, really encouraging us and saying, let's move this. The Kepsa Management, led by our CEO, very able Carol Kariuki, and the whole team, I think Martha, the whole lot, lot of you. Uh, well done for, for continuing this whole manifesto and really encouraging this to say, this is what we need to have, because ultimately, whichever side, we need to really entrench what we want to look at. The Mkenya Daima team, I think Martha Chiruto, um, Susan, and, uh, and the whole team out there, Ferdi, the whole, whole lot of teams, I think uh, the communications team, um, I think I want to say a very, uh, very big thank you for them, to say let's make sure there's Mkenya Daima, the, the crux is now, and really want to take it up make it happen. Uh, all KEPSA members, uh, all the members who are online and those who are also here present today, I think there's a whole long list I've been provided and I can't say it all right now, but all the captains of industry, both physically and virtually present, thank you very much. The entire media team, I think all the media people who are here today, uh, we must say thank you very much. And I think this is crucial for us to say, you are the people who got to disseminate this information right to the grassroots. And I think this is important to say, let these issues be brought out, let them all see it, and really, um, you know, make that happen. To all the service providers today, I think the video, the hotel, uh, the conferencing, all the facilities, and to the team that put it together. I think, Polly, we take your message, go see, and see is your Kaizen, it's your go see uh, in the Gemba, in the place where it's happening, and really take action. I think that's action behind words, because we've had a lot of NATO in the past. NATO is no action talk only. And I think this is where we need to move on and say, fine, let's get this done. But at the end of the day, I think scorecards. We all have scorecards. And I think that's important for us, uh, even in the private sector, everywhere else. Um, 
Mkenya Daima is composed of, you've been told already, I think, it's the religious sectors, it's, it's civil society, everybody to put together. But I think everybody has scorecards, and really, go check your scorecards individually. You will vote for whomever you want to, but ultimately, let's go back to issue-based. I know we have the women's groups, we have the youth, we have everybody together, and those people count. And I think this important point is we are transformative in Kenya, and I think we're transforming into a far more democratic organization, I think, as Kenya. And Kenya Inc., is democratic and this sort of dialogue is encouraged so I think this is a fantastic thing that we have so I just want to say thank you all very much for coming and um, thank you to the team best of luck may the best people win and uh, all our best wishes to everyone thank you very much we'd wish to play the Kenya Daima song to Shangilie Kenya let us celebrate the country and may God bless you all and go out and make a difference. I've been your host, Martha Cerito. God bless you. Let's go. DJ, please.
Pra qualquer mão, qualquer mão, qualquer mão. Pode ir, pode ir. Pode ir, pode ir.